message is being broadcast by the Department of Defense of the Republic. At 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, multiple unidentified objects were confirmed to have entered the Earth's atmosphere. Discovery Houston, 22nd LOS Dredd. The first message that comes to you is you are a divine being. You matter. You count. You come from realms of unimaginable power and life, and you will return to those realms. The vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. Hi. Broadcasting from Forest Tower Studios, all the way from the Deep South. Now, here is your host, Joe Root. Broadcasting from atop a hill in a shack in the mossy creek bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas. This is Lighting the Void, and I'm Joe Root. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight, wherever you're listening from. And it is Wednesday night, July 3rd, on into the 4th. Uh, tonight, we're going to get the pleasure of speaking with Walter Bosley, an author, investigator, and a very well-known figure in the truth-seeking community. And we're going to be discussing one of our history's greatest conquerors, Napoleon Latitude 33, or known by others as, you know, the 33rd Parallel, as well as the occult, the esoteric, and maybe get into some investigative practices and the mentality uh, behind a lot of this stuff, too. And I want... Don't forget that tomorrow night, I want you guys to know that I am taking the night off. That's right. It's 4th of July. Other than Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. And uh, Corbin and I are probably going to try to blow stuff up. I think we're going to binge on Stranger uh, Stranger Things, the, the third season. And then we're probably just going to blow stuff up all night. So I will try to find if some of you guys really aren't doing anything and you want to listen to the show. I will try to set something very special up for you guys. Uh, this show is brought to you by Get the Tea. Don't forget to go to the webinar on the 15th. Ronnie will be there, and uh, we're going to do something really special for you guys on the 15th, all right? Monday night, 5 p.m. Pacific. Go to getthetea.com and sign up for the webinar. The show was also brought to you by ancientlifeoil.com, the best CBD oil on the planet, and preparewithafringe.com. Thank you for all the new supporters and a big warm uh shout out to amanda and uh you know you know why thank you so much i love you guys over on discord i love you guys over on spreaker i can't thank you enough all right uh you can also head over to ufoseekers.com if you want to check out the latest and greatest info on what's going on in the ufo community if you want to keep a journalistic approach to what's going on at ufo seekers on twitter check out their youtube channel youtube.com forward slash ufo seekers and if you've had a sighting give them a call at 661 ufo 7889 so tonight this is going to be a, this is a real treat for me uh because well i'll tell you about that in a second as soon as we get walt walter in here but just in case you don't know who he is he's an investigator of historical occult mysteries an author of pulp fiction novels and a screenwriter who's appeared on history channels ancient aliens and after 19 years in national security, Bosley is a licensed private investigator in California, where he also runs a small press publishing company, Lost Continent Library, founded in 2002. Bosley has traveled much of the world, both on the job and off, including trips through Mexico and South America with David Hatcher's Childress, or David Hatcher Childress, excuse me, whose Wex magazine has published articles by Bosley. Uh, he was born in San Diego, California, and attended uh, college where he earned a bachelor's in journalism, and he has been employed by the FBI. He's also an inactive reserve officer in the U.S. Air Force, for which he served as a special agent of the AFOSI uh, while on active duty, and then worked as a counterterrorism operational consultant for six years following his military services. And now he's got tons of books out, nonfiction, fiction, steampunk, uh, you name it, and you guys go check out the website. I put the uh, the show notes up there. The website is empireofthewheel.blogspot.com. That is the one that we're going to be referring to uh, tonight. Walter, thank you so much for joining Lighting the Void and the Fringe FM. It's good to have you here, man. 
Hey, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to uh, talking about this stuff tonight. Yeah, I am too. I am too. And I just want to say real quick um, that I can definitely see why you're a big deal to a lot of people uh, because I got, obviously I got on YouTube and started looking around and all of the people that I respect as uh, uh, journalists or people that I know that are truth seekers, regardless of what the crowd is saying and all that, you know, they've all had you on their show. They all respect you. And I, ever since I talked to you for the first time, I was very curious about getting to talk to you one-on-one and looking into your work and all of your writings and stuff. I can tell that you take a very unique approach to what you do and in a way that it's very detailed and you actually, and when I say this, I don't mean uh, the others don't, but it's very nice to have somebody that is looking into the truth when it comes to history and these subjects that has a background like you do that can really get detailed. And I can see why a lot of people are addicted to your work. Well, Hey, thanks. I'm that's, that's very, uh, all, always flattering to hear that, that people appreciate, um, you know, what you do. And, and I do indeed try to approach this, um, this stuff I look into and, and, uh, you know, I look at what I write as I'm reporting it to the reader and it's really no different than when I was a federal agent, a criminal investigator. And that is you just, re- you know, you report what you find. And any analytical, you know, addition to that should be objective. You know, there's, there's always the fun stuff. There, there are things that I would love something to be. But if I find that it might not be that or, or you know, or, or it's completely something else, I just believe in, you know, saying, hey, I'd like it to be this, but you know what? It looks like it's that. And I think people really appreciate that, particularly in, uh, you know, this community we're in, because, you know, there's a, there's a percentage of knuckleheads out there that, you know, tell crazy stories. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Right. And I, you know, I've had a, my older producer, who's now my partner on the fringe FM is Eric Markham. One of the smartest guys I know, right. Is a scientist and, I, we started thinking about guests and he's like, listen, you really, I don't know if you can get them, but you really need to talk to Walter Bosley. And I said, well, I want to, let's keep trying. Right. And then when Pancho hit me up and said, Hey, we got Walter Bosley. I was stoked. So yeah, I'm not blowing smoke, man. Cool. I'm, I do appreciate your work. Well, well Hey, thanks. And, and I'm not that hard to get on the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they asked, I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, any, any opportunity to, talk about this stuff, you know, with, with particularly a new audience. Um, I always jump at that chance because, you know, it's, it's why I do this. I like right. talking about this stuff. I like thinking about it and digging into it. So I'm, I'm glad to be here, you know? Yeah. I'm, and I'm curious as to like, you've talked about a lot of things, folklore, uh, you've talked about the, the occult, UFOs, aliens, history. I'm really interested in your uh, series that you just got through doing, um, Empire of the Wheel. I'm really, I really can't wait to dig into that as well. But what got you interested in looking to alternative histor- historical figures like Napoleon? I mean, what got you into this? Well, I have at this this time presently ten nonfiction books, and as you just stated there, and as you know. They're, they're on the surface, really di- kind of diverse subjects. You know, there's the secret mission series, which with Napoleon, I'm on book four. And then of course there's the empire, of the world trilogy about the weird occult murder, strange synchronicity, crazy stuff. <laughs> and then there's the Disneyland book. And then there's a breakaway civilization book. And then there's a book that talks about my dad's experience with um, uh, what he claimed was a UFO retrieval and, and getting briefed on Roswell and, and so these sound like, wow, you know, they're different subjects. How do you get into that? But, the, but they're all the result of my pulling threads. And when I'm researching one thing and I'm pulling threads in that, I, I go where those threads lead. And that's how I ended up. Honestly, with all these subjects I've written, it all goes back to the first nonfiction book, Latitude 33. We'll be discussing that tonight. The one about Disneyland. Because that one, following up on that one, led to the Empire of the Wheel mystery. <laughs> and that all led to uh, the Juan Cabrillo book, which was 
first the first secret missions book and so you can see uh basically i i pull threads and i go wherever they take me um now how i got into this this world of this kind of weird stuff to begin with because the disneyland book was really motivated by a personal strange experience i had at disneyland years ago which again we'll be discussing that later but um uh from the time i was a kid I was interested in UFOs and strange things. So I was always kind of leaning that way with my interests, um, even though my career path, you know, is along the lines of national security, which, which looks like it would have nothing to do with the weird stuff. But believe me, it's, it's, uh, there's weirdos like me in there interested in this stuff all throughout that community, the national security profession. Really? Okay. So the, the interest was always there but I just started pulling threads. Yeah. I mean, that, that was one of my biggest questions. Like how does somebody that's trained in this stuff, you know, this investigative practice and what, and all the other things that you were trained in, how did you get involved, Mm -hmm. involved into looking into these things? Because it does make people like me and others wonder, you know, does Walter Bosley know something we don't, I mean, I'm sure you've been asked that question before, right? Or did he see something that made him think that there was some really stuff? a lot of the stuff going on that we see in the conspiratorial field. We do, we do think about those things. Well, it's, it's, and, and I, I understand why, because, you know, you're, you're looking at someone who's done the things I do and you wonder, okay, what the heck, Uh, you know, I can say that, um, of the things I've discussed and that I've written that were directly influenced by my national security career, are primarily the uh, any any time I discuss um, classified human technology as the um, as an not the not the because there's multiple answers but um, as an answer to most UFO sightings. Okay, that's really um, my confidence and my position on that and in my research on that is backed up by my experience as an Air Force officer and an OSI agent and being exposed to technology and hearing about, you know, stuff um, uh, along the way like that. And um, the same with when I wrote the book Shimmering Light about my dad's Air Force experience, you know, which he said he was briefed on Roswell and all the stuff that's in that book. Um, you know, so when, when you see me talking about those things, those are greatly directly informed by that experience. Now, having been a criminal investigator taught me, um, the, uh, the proper method of professional investigations. I brought to it a natural aptitude. You know, you don't get recruited into that stuff, which I was by a mentor, um, you get recruited into that because, you know, people see, okay, you have an, kind of the right aptitude to be an objective and observant and investigator, that kind of thing. So I brought just that, you know, I, I kind of brought that into it uh, myself. But really, other than what we've just been talking about, how the, my uh, books or, or discussion about technology and UFOs and the, the thing about my dad and the, and the uh, classified human technology, all the other weird stuff I've written about, like I said, these were things that were either, I was either experiencing or I was into, you know, um, before I started that career and the career kind of introduced me to a little more of it, um, but also trained me in how to investigate it. Um, in, in really the proper way, you know, the honest way, that's the key thing there is, um, it, uh, my experience, my professional experience is, you know, it just contributes to the honesty in what I'm reporting. Right. Yeah. And I know that a lot of that stuff, like national security, the FBI, everybody's given a job and everything's need to know. And I think we forget that sometimes, like, you mm-hmm. you may get in there and actually witness something weird, something unexplainable, but if it's need to know or you can't get to it, you're not you can't, right? You may you just may witness something and that's it. Does that kind of what happened? Yeah, yeah. It's um you know, you're doing your job and your job is this track over here, right? So in the course of your job, you need to uh, be aware of something, be briefed in on something. And 
depending upon where you're coming from, in my case, I'm coming from the position of being interested in this stuff before I ever got into the job. Yeah. I would see something and I'd, and, and I would recognize, Hey, wait a minute, this thing that I'm looking at, this thing I'm learning about, this could explain that over here in, in the weird realm. And so, you know, you can kind of do the math and put it together. And, right. And in some cases you, in some cases you are told some things, but the interesting way in which you're told some of the wilder stuff is that they will get, they will have your, your mentor, so to speak, a, you know, a, a, someone who's a superior, uh, um, what's the word for it? You know, I'm they're They're my super, not supervisor, but you know, someone superior in rank or in position. And they'll tell you about some of the wilder things in a more casual manner, in a more casual setting. And what that does is that builds in culpable deniability so that if you run your mouth inappropriately, well, it can be denied. They can say, well, he was never sat in a vault and shown a, a file with this information. This is stuff he's making up, you know? Right. Um, so uh, that's what I learned is some of the wilder, crazier things I was told were told to me in just that setting by a superior officer. Ah, okay. See, and what I'm trying to do is paint a picture for people about you because I I don't think, and I'm not trying to put down the community at all, but I don't think that this community is really used to real journalism and real investigations. Not yet. I think that I think we have a few people like yourself that are doing the job uh, but there's so many biases and beliefs and preconceived notions in the community uh, that it causes a ruckus, right? And you upset people. But I do think mm-hmm. that there are people, there are more people now than ever that just don't care about that anymore. They just want the truth. And I've talked to them on the show. I've, they've emailed me about it. And I think things are shifting. I think we all uh, want to know the truth. And, uh, before we get into your new book, I just wanted to paint that picture about you because um, when I look at things like that, like take, for instance, the Tom DeLong case and all that, everybody's talking about it. There's a lot of biases. There's a lot of people that just don't want to believe it emotionally. And then there's a lot of people that want to believe it emotionally where I've seen you call BS on things that are just BS and things that, you know, you might look at besides the fact there's a, there could be something that's BS. For example, like you write nonfiction. Well, I did see somewhere, and I don't know if I was reading it or I heard it in an interview you did, where you said, you know, I think this whole thing is crazy, blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to read Secret Machines because there might be something in there, like a little gem of something that is hidden, right? And I've always wondered mm-hmm. that about nonfiction. Do, do people put things that they're afraid to talk about in there or something that they are afraid that the community just won't accept? You see what I'm saying? And I saw, I kind of heard yeah. that in, in what you were saying. Yeah. Well, you know, another reason why I will, if, if I'm going to be critical of something, um, I, I want to read it. I want to see it. I, you know, I have a very good friend who has written, in my opinion, what is the uh, one of the, if not the, um, depends on the day you ask me, uh, best research book on Roswell. And it is the um, it's the most inconvenient book. None of the UFO people will ever mention it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't like it when you bring it up. And the biggest critics of it, I've asked them, and to a man, to a person, not one of them has bothered to read the book. And that bothers me. If you're going to be, you know, critical of something, do your homework. You know, read what it says. Watch the film. You know, listen to their you know, their, their show or something. And, and you'll, you'll be coming from a stronger position in your criticism. If you choose still to criticize them, that's the other thing is, you know, a lot of people, um, they just want to, I think, hear themselves talk. Right. (laughs) And I'm guilty of that. Whether they know what they're saying. Yeah. But I know (laughs) what you're saying. uh, But yeah, yeah, people people want to on on what you said before that. Uh, what what you first started saying was uh, people uh, they want to hear what they want to hear, right? And whether it's uh, you know accurate or not, whether it's the truth or not, there's people out there that just want to hear what they want to hear. 
And depending upon the individual, they can be uncomfortable to some degree with, you know, when you say something contrary. And I've encountered that because I'm not afraid to, if I think, like you said, if I think something is just not true or nonsense, uh, I'll say it. Yeah. And you'll say why too. Uh, Look, coming out in this community and saying you guys like the big things, right? Like saying Roswell, not what you think it is. Didn't happen. Things like that, that, you know, that upsets people, but you've always talked Mm -hmm. about why. Right. And I think people just, as soon as they hear something that, that, um, and we'll move on from this, but I'm just telling you why I appreciate this stuff. But I think when, when people hear something that they don't like, or doesn't go along with their beliefs on a subject, they tune out the rest Mm -hmm. of the information, right? They just, right block it out no more don't want to hear it and uh, but i do think that's changing i absolutely think it's changing i've seen it shift right uh, a lot so um your new your new well, you book, know you, yeah go ahead yeah t- comment on i that. was just going to comment i'm glad you mentioned roswell in there because it's a very good example of how i've encountered this you know um they there's people that wonder because i say roswell indeed happened but here's what i think it actually was not what the popular lore is and and you get people that say well wait a minute if you think it happened how can you think it's anything but an extraterrestrial incident and i say well here's why and that's why i actually one of the reasons why i felt like i ultimately needed to write that book i did shimmering light because i lay it all out why i think what i think and and um it, it you know it goes back to what you say it's it's a comfort zone for people really so did you ever find um did you ever feel any pressure though um from the community <clears throat> even though you you know you're doing your journalism and your investigative uh practices the way you do mm-hmm. things I'm sure you've got a formula as to how you do it did the pressure of the community ever make you feel like you didn't want to do this anymore or that it was kind of senseless or that you know what you know what I'll just write nonfiction cuz these people just don't want to hear the truth like I've felt that before that pressure of almost like wanting to give up on things sometimes, not, not because for the community's sake, like I would still look it into myself, but bringing it out into the public, there's a lot of pressure mm-hmm. and it does get to you sometimes. It does to me anyways. I've never, I, you know, really it's a reflection again, um, the kind of person I am, look at the profession I ended up in, um, that outside pressure that doesn't, influence me in the slightest in what I feel I'm doing or what I have to do. Um, This is one of the traits of being a good criminal investigator, because when you're a military agent, for example, you got to sit there and, 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 and sometimes basically tell a general to sit down and, and, you know, (laughs) he's got to come clean or you got to be tough enough to handle people that have more power and more authority than you. And so you can't be the kind of, you know, you can't let that external pressure affect you. And how that reflects in my writing is, no, the answer to your question is, no, I've never, um, in fact, the only thing I've wondered is, okay, I'm pulling threads and I'm writing what I want to. Uh, gosh, are people going to be interested in this? And as it turns out, that they are. So I've stayed true to my ethics. I've stayed you know, true to my values in this as a nonfiction writer, as a researcher. And, and it's paying off because I'm finding that people really are interested in this stuff I'm putting out there because mm-hmm. I don't know of many other people in this field that write about the stuff that I do specifically write about, you know, some of the generalities and some of the topics are there. Yes. But, um, I just, like I said, I just, you know, keep it honest and, uh, uh you know, yeah, keep pulling the threads. As long as I have something to write, um, I never worry about that. Which is that mentality, as you said before, is probably, the reason, like you mentioned before, why you why you were uh, got the job and were able to investigate and do these types of things. And again, we appreciate it. Look, when we come back, uh, we're going to get into this. We're going to get into your new book, uh, The Occult, The 33rd Parallel, Napoleon, some esoteric stuff. We're here with Walter Bosley. You guys stay with us.
Aloha, Fringe listeners. This is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. This is Corbin, son of the one and only Joe Root, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. So, have you heard of heavy metals? I'm not talking about the heavy metals in the junkyard. I'm talking about the heavy metals that build up in your body. Heavy metals in your body can make you feel sluggish, fatigued, and just plain off. Why not try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com? Cleansing your body and making you feel great. No, not cleansing the outside of your body, but cleansing the inside of your body of intruders that sneak their way into you and set up an intruder camp. Life Change Tea helps remove unwanted intruder camps. Brew it. Steep it and drink in the results. Tastes great so you can create a new health habit. Our tea loves to help people. It just needs the chance. So order yours today by logging on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Our life change super strength tea is waiting. This could be a beautiful relationship. Take charge of your health. Order at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. All right, everyone. This is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your northern self and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussel, but he ain't no holy fryer. Anyway, you be the Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. Alex. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Who were the real ancient Egyptians? What is it about ancient Egypt that captivates us all? The critically acclaimed series Magical Egypt is back with all new episodes. Let Chance Gardner and company take you on another adventure through Magical Egypt in the new series Magical Egypt 2. Magical Egypt 2 attempts a forensic reconstruction of the science of the ancients through a study of ancient aesthetics. Also, the best researchers and authors in the field like John Anthony West, Graham Hanson, Hancock, Laird Scranton, Robert Duvall, Lon Mal Duquette, Aaron Cheek, and more join together to explore the topics of the esoteric and the hidden messages of the ancient Egyptians. Just go to MagicalEgypt.com right now and put in the code word FRINGE and get 10% off any download or order, including the groundbreaking original Magical Egypt series, as well as the new episodes of Magical Egypt 2. Also, check out the great work and the companion series at MagicalEgypt.com. Click the banner on the Fringe FM or go to MagicalEgypt.com and use the code word FRINGE and get 10% off your order today while it lasts. We've heard your feedback loud and clear. You called it out, and now we're answering. All new live programming, five nights a week. Always remember, the Fringe FM is for you, the listener, and we appreciate your feedback. Keep the feedback coming. You can email us at talkback at thefringe.fm, call the station at 501-777-5631, or send us a message on Facebook at the Fringe FM. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. I'm Ryan Gable, and I want to remind you to keep your radio, phone, tablet, or computer tuned to The Fringe FM. And visit the website, thefringe.fm, to listen to the entire lineup of shows. You can also catch my broadcast, The Secret Teachings, Monday through Friday, beginning at 12 a.m. midnight U.S. Pacific Time, right here on The Fringe FM. Howdy, this is Catalina, and you're listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop. All right, welcome back to Lighting the Void. Happy 4th for the, some of you guys that just went into the 4th of July. And uh, we are talking to, speaking of which, uh, a guy that previously worked with the military, Walter Bosley, an investigator and author. And uh, we're looking into his new book about Napoleon. And uh, 
I, I just think it's fascinating that you got into a guy like, like Napoleon. So when I look at these books, I'm looking at uh, Empire of the Wheel and all of these subjects are, I mean, you talk about, you got pictures of Crowley here, like those three books I really want to get into. And then we go up to your new book, The Esoteric Napoleon, which I don't see a lot of people talking about. And uh, I wonder what, what triggered you about Napoleon? What got you locked into this story? Ah, that's that in itself is a it's a fun story. Um, for years, I had been about a little less than tw- less than twenty years ago. I had first heard the tale of um, Napoleon Bonaparte spending a night in the Great Pyramid and coming out all pale and shaken, and he wouldn't he wouldn't tell anybody what happened. And um, I really never found anything. I never looked into it. I just was aware of that. And then um, I'm really good friends with uh, Dr. Joseph Farrell, and he used to live about a half hour drive from me where I live now. And so we'd hang out a lot. I'd go up and we'd have these late night, just imagine a couple of nerdy writers of strange things, you know, hanging out till the wee hours of the morning talking strange stuff. Right. And one of the, excuse me, one of the conversations, the topics that would come up um, fairly uh, regularly, more often than not, was uh, Napoleon and uh, the Louisiana Purchase, because we both suspected that there were some, you know, hmm, you know, interesting things that have been unsaid about the Louisiana Purchase. And of course, there's the um, mystery of the what looks like the murder of Meriwether Lewis which um, not that many people. I think only um, an author, Zavient Hayes, is the only one to have written about that so far. And so talking about Napoleon and the, the, the weird stuff that might be associated with Louisiana Purchase and, of course, then this pyramid story, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, have to look into that someday. And I was, again, visiting Joseph where he had moved to, and we went to his favorite bookstore, and I happened to find a copy of a book I'd heard of, but I'd never read, never found, and that's Bonaparte in Egypt by uh, Christopher Harold, which is a uh, mid-20th century publication. And so I grabbed that. I scooped that up, and I thought, okay, this looks like a good one. And um, I'm not at this time expecting to do a book on Napoleon. I bought another book that same day that uh, was intending to contribute to furthering my Juan Cabrillo research. And I read that one first when I got home. So when I finally cracked open the Herald book on uh, Bonaparte in Egypt, when Napoleon went on his Egyptian expedition, I was blown away. I learned about a Napoleon that I never heard about in school. I never saw in movies. We're always taught that he was this short, fat, balding, little glum megalomaniac. Okay. A, A big, mean tyrant, just a bad guy. Right. And from the Herald book, I was learning, okay, he, he went on an expedition to Egypt. This expedition lasted over a year. Okay. He was fascinated by science and archaeology and ancient history. Wow. I didn't know that. And when he went to Egypt, he was, he was a young general. He was only like 26 or something when he became general. You know, when he went to Egypt, he was not yet 30 years old. He was this slim, slender, young lion guy, you know, and, and long hair. He had long hair um, below his shoulders, and uh, the ladies loved him. Uh, and he has this wit, this charm about him, and, and very much a sense of humor that can be self-deprecating. And I'm thinking, well, this is not a glum megalomaniac who, you know, is a jerk, you know. Um, and the more I read after reading the uh, Herald book, um, I just kept reading more and more, and I realized, oh my gosh, um, this he qualifies for my secret mission series. This is a man who was on um, a personal quest from you know a young age who happened to be a man of great destiny and um, really used his fortunes as a as a military commander, a military genius, um, then as a uh, of course a political leader, um, to uh, actually provide an opportunity for and fuel his personal quest, his, his interests. And um, what I learned basically was the real Napoleon was not nearly 
the the caricature that we're shown in movies and taught in school. And I learned that the caricature is pretty much a product of the British propaganda of the day. And so I, I was fascinated. And the more threads I pulled, the more interesting it became. And, you know, I realized, okay, this is the next Secret Missions book. And I'll tell you, there's so much there that I found that you'll see um, on the title page of the first book, it says volume one. Oh, yeah. So you got tons of stuff you want to talk about then. Yeah. yeah. And I'm working on volume two now. Uh, well, there's plenty to talk about just from volume one tonight. But um, here's the thing. Napoleon Bonaparte, um, and uh, it, it is depending upon the source, he either is the most written about historical figure or he's right up there next to, I, I believe, Christ is, you know, Jesus Christ is the, um, of the last couple hundred years or so, is, uh, it's between him and Napoleon being, as being the most written about historical figures. I mean, thousands of pages have been written about this man from his lifetime right on up to today. And, you know, my book looks at just uh, uh, three, three main points and just looks at the slices that I need to look at to explore those points. It's in no way a, a comprehensive biography, for example. It's, it's not that. It's, it's a very specific book, and I'm still doing two volumes, and it's specific. So um, we're talking, I read almost, um, I read over uh, almost 6,000 pages of biographical material on Napoleon oh, Bonaparte for research for this book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, a stack of books, and and this is biographical material dating from his lifetime, his, his contemporaries, through the decades on up to, uh, I think, 2014 or 15 is one of the most recent books. Um, so, you know, I got the gamut, um, the and, and a lot of those, as you got into the 20th century and into our era, they are based on the dozens of other books that, you know, I just... I wasn't able to read or I, you know, I wouldn't be, wouldn't have been writing the book for another five years if I tried to read everything. So, you know, I like to remind folks that, that in no way is it comprehensive. And, you know, when you talk about this, people can say, well, what about this or what about that? And, and did you know this? And that's the beauty of the um, subject of Napoleon is there's just so much there. And what's really tragic is we're not taught that. We're not shown that. We're just given the British um, historical caricature uh, and the Nostradamus nonsense, which is complete nonsense. The whole thing about him being, you know, the first Antichrist. Uh, the, these, these oh, were yeah. Antichrist uh, number one. By, or I thought he was number two. Yeah, Wasn't exactly. Alexander the Great number one? No, it was Napoleon's number Napoleon. one, Hitler's number two, and the, the third is this Mabuse who's yet to come. Gotcha. But here's the thing. All of that is based on uh, poor, erroneous translations of Nostradamus to begin with, and it was all heavily influenced by British propaganda and, and historical propaganda. So it, it's, it's nonsense. The Nostradamus-Napoleon stuff is nonsense. It's garbage. Um, is is British propaganda, you know, do you find that as something when it comes to, to looking into history and finding out that the narratives are all messed up? I hate to say this, but I, find, I wonder if the British play, like how major of a role does their specific propaganda play in a lot of our history? Well, it, it, it honestly depends on the subject. We're talking about Napoleon Bonaparte, and here's the problem the British had with him, okay? The British were like the... Um, uh, I'm not trying to be sexist here, but I, the, the image of, you know, the, the jealous girl at the prom who sees the other girl um, become the prom queen, okay? Gotcha. Yeah. That's the way the Brits were towards Napoleon during the Napoleonic era. They were, they were still charging forth, building their empire, building their hegemony, and um, here was this guy, Napoleon, this French guy, who was outdoing them and outclassing them at every turn. And kicking everybody's butt on the battlefield. Um, so they, they were jealous of him to begin with because he was accomplishing what they wanted to accomplish, and they didn't like that. So basically he was just their, their political and economic rival. He was their, 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 the, the rival to their ego. And 
by by Napoleon's rise, where they had to deal with him, remember, they were coming off the uh, the humiliation of the American Revolution, and it indeed was a humiliation for England. Um, our the American Revolution was, and Napoleon was a great admirer of America and of our revolution and such. So that just made it worse. He was a dedicated um, uh, Enlightenment, uh, you know, leader. Um, and of course, you know, the monarchies and the dynasties are not too fond. We're not too fond of the enlightenment because it empowers the common man. And that's another thing Napoleon was doing in the countries that he would conquer. He would actually make the conditions for the people there better than they had been before under their own leaders. And that of course made, you know, all those leaders mad. Um, so it was, it was, it was really a case of jealousy. Did you know there were of the um, nine, I believe there were nine Napoleonic Wars, eight or nine, um, it, it's all but one of them were started by the British or the various, their European allies. Napoleon Bonaparte only started one of the Napoleonic Wars. Now, I know they named it this because of the era, but really those wars should be called the wars of uh, British and European dynastic aggression. Wow. Um, not only did they make all but one of those wars, they would declare war on the man himself, on Napoleon. They made it clear. They state this. When you read the biography and the history, they state that you know they were – their war wasn't against France. It was against Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, and, and the more you read about him and the more you read in the details, was he perfect? No. Of course he made mistakes. You know, Anybody in that position is going to. But he regretted um, – his mistakes uh, a lot more than we're ever told in traditional mainstream history. We're told that he, again, was just the yeah. crazy make the maniac running willy nilly doing what he wanted to. And you no, know, when, um, yeah, in school I was taught, that, well. I was taught he was a, a tyrant, right? And he was there to conquer the world and a tyrant. No, and that's the picture that they, <laughs> right. they painted yeah. in school. Right. Yeah. But what you're telling me yeah. is this guy, was a liberator of the common man, a conqueror, sure, but possibly a yeah. conqueror to liberate the world. Yes, well, you know, there are, there have been historians since Napoleon's time. You know, number one, they credit him with the fi putting the final nail in the coffin of the overt feudal system. He his the, their whole encounter with him and and what he did really ended the, the feudal system as, you know, we knew it, you know, all, all those centuries. And also there were historians after him that, that stated uh, Europe would have been much better off um, had Napoleon, you know, not been run off, been forced, forced out. Um, that, it, there's been some that even have gone as far to say that he would have curbed the Prussian than Germanic aggression. And what is that saying? That's saying maybe, maybe the world wars of the 20th century might have been, uh, if not avoided, um, much lesser conflicts than they turned out to be. Because remember, when Napoleon was pushed off the scene, you know, the Prussians and the, uh, you know, and then of course, after that unified Germany, they were able to just, you know, you did have your Franco-Prussian war, you did have, you know, those conflicts, but Prussia was a lot freer to do the things they did that led to 20th century Germany than they would have been had Napoleon, um, you know, had things been different and Napoleon had been around long. Yeah. So, so when I look at the book, the esoteric Napoleon, I can tell you right mm -hmm. off the bat before reading it, what it makes me think about uh, is people that like great leaders, even Hitler, people like that, that, we hear stories that they would get into the esoteric and the occult of some manner mm -hmm. and look into the hidden power. I've heard stories and read books, mm -hmm. and don't know if it's true, uh, that Hitler believed that uh, certain objects were magical and that they helped him conquer and things like that. Did you find any of that with Napoleon at all? No, not in objects. Not uh, And he never, um, his interests in this kind of thing, were something that was a, a – they were a personal interest of his. It was like a personal track. And uh, the, the closest thing – and I'm exploring this in the second book, so I'm kind of still you know, getting deeper into the research. 
the closest thing we can point to that says, did he use any of this arcane knowledge for, you know, for his uh, political or, you know, what have you, military, whatever aspirations and, and successes. And um, it, it, it's, it's kind of vague. It, it will remain in the area of speculation because I think whatever he would have learned in that regard and developed, well, yes, of course he would have used it, but it wasn't in the ways near it so far as I have found that um, Hitler, you know, uh, the intentions that Hitler had with getting the, for instance, the spear of destiny or looking for, you know, whatever the grail was and, and those kinds of things. He was looking for um, objects of power, whereas Napoleon um, also, oh my gosh, Napoleon would do when he would, you know, invade and conquer, he would grab art, he would grab documents, but he was looking for something, for information. Um, there's nothing I found that um, ever shows that Napoleon was looking for an object of power that would, you know, be some kind of thing that would give him power to, to rule and but he was interested people. in it. You could tell he was trying he to was find looking, something. Right? He was looking for knowledge. Yeah, he gotcha. was looking for knowledge possibly about his his own past, because in my book I talk about um there's a question about Napoleon's paternity. There was during his lifetime. And I get into that in the books and I think that um he was looking for some answers about his his own personal identity and in his his genealogical past and i think he was you know, he was definitely looking for answers to um you know the mysteries of the human psyche and th he was very much the philosopher scientist at heart this was the most important thing to him that was the big uh, surprise that i learned when i first started reading about it was that he you know being a brilliant military officer and being this you know political leader and then an emperor these were all second to his interest in, um, you know, arcane subjects, archaeology, ancient history, um, uh, you know, the mystical subjects. And that just blew my mind that, you know, this is what this guy was about. You know, I'm curious, other than Napoleon, since you do uh, some pretty hardcore detailed investigative work here, do you ever mm -hmm. find... Like, because I talk about the occult and esoteric all the time, and the only thing I can convey is my experience with it. Uh, some people would say, well, those are just uh, a lot of super coincidences. But I've found that there is definitely something to the esoteric, the occult, the power behind it. But this is a, my, my own testimony. I'm not stating it as fact. Mm -hmm. And the, mm -hmm. what fascinates me about this is when you look into a book like this, some of the greatest historical figures in our time were going down this same road. Like they kind of knew there was something to it in a way. Now, I'm not so sure I'd have to read your book about as to what he might've been looking for, but you see what you understand what I'm saying? Like they knew there was something yes. to it as well. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, I learned, I, I, I no longer believe in coincidence. My experience um, with synchronicity. Uh, this all came at me during the Empire of the Wheel investigation. Now, I'll be honest with you, weird stuff had been happening to me since I w was a teenager, but it, it just really escalated during the years that I was investigating and working on the Empire of the Wheel stuff. And it made me a believer. It demonstrated things to me to the extent that, uh, you know, I tell people, I don't really give a darn who believes me and who doesn't. I don't because I know what's real. Um, by 2010, up until 2010, I, you know, like any other person, I'd want to share these experiences with friends and say, I mean, wow, this is, you know, I'd, I'd want to, I'd, I would want to tell them and, and, you know, deep inside you want, you know, you want them to believe you. And, right. you know, depending upon who you talk to, you'd get, oh, that's nice. And I, I kind of, I, I crossed the Rubicon, so to speak, um, after one particular experience in which I saw something on a particular piece of terrain when I was in a particular location, and it was startling. And after that, I just seemed to know that, hey, you know what? These things, these things are real. There is this, 
There, there's more to the spectrum of reality than we commonly see. And it doesn't matter if anyone believes you or not. And it's very liberating. Now, I will say this. I rarely, uh, usually never, but I rarely mention my personal experiences in my nonfiction. I keep myself out of my books for the most part. Now, obviously, I wrote a book about my father. Well, of course, I'm going to be you know, somewhat in that book. But um, it's mostly, I mean, it's about my dad and it's about the historical stuff I write about. So I have these experiences, but I'm not interested in, in uh, you know, sometimes I say, gee, maybe I ought to, but I, I just never do. I'm not interested in writing a book about me and my weird experiences to try to convince anybody or even document it. I, cause I see these as personal. Now what they do is they inform me and they guide me to leads. They, 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 Weirdness has definitely guided me to leads, but what I do when I get to those leads is I pull the threads, and it will not end up in my books unless I find some historical or documentary or you know some type of evidence beyond my own experience to back it up. You see, I wonder I why though. I why? Won't. Why are you? Why? Because I'm very curious and interested in your personal experience. Is it? Is mm -hmm. it because of your? You want to have your work stay integral? Is that what it is? Uh, uh, because that's that's part of it. Yeah. Okay. Because I am that, when when you said the book about your dad immediately, I was like, okay, mm -hmm. which one is that? That's the one I want to read, right? <laughs> like <laughs> shimmering I'm not, light. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying yeah. that I don't want to read your book about your investigations. I obviously, do. But I found, uh, and you can debate me on this, but I have found that people's personal experience oftentimes really goes against the common narrative and reveals mm -hmm. certain things. But then you've got oh, conditions yeah. like the human mind, your own beliefs and things. Mm -hmm. And it's, right. it's not really journalism, but I do find a lot of interesting things there I re that, uh, that I think are true. Yeah. It, it's here's part of uh, half of it is, yeah, the, the integrity of what I'm writing. I, you know, um, I, I've got a, you know, I started footnoting my books after I think the second one. And, um, you know, so I, I and, and that's the agent in me, the professional investigator. Here's my report. My book is my report of investigation. And I'm going to show you my sources for the things I say. And if I'm speculating, I, I identify that boldly and clearly when I'm just speculating now. But here's the other half of it. The reason I'm reticent to talk publicly about these things is um, specifically my experience with Empire of the Wheel introduced me to, um, well, what I have come to accept as um, the source of a lot of the strangeness that I encountered in investigating the Empire of the Wheel stuff. And this source, there is this, uh, this saying, this ethic that's associated with her. It's a female goddess-level entity. And we're not talking about Gaia, Mother Earth, and all that New Agey who is hawks. it Egyptian? Uh, Can I ask I, that? I, I uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's Hecate. Like, ah, okay. And Hecate associates with the goddess Isis in Egyptian pantheon. Okay, right. And she's the veiled Isis, the veiled goddess. Okay. Now, um, here's the thing: when she lifts her veil to show you her true face, it, that's symbolic for. She's lifting that veil to, sh to give you a glimpse of more of, of the wider reality. You know, she's showing you more. She's showing you things that you just, in the common experience, we don't readily see. And that's a gift, okay? And, and there's this, this saying, it's called the admonition of Isis. And that is when she lifts her veil, tell no one. These experiences that we all have, I'm not special. I'm not some guru or messiah nonsense figure like some of these people in our sure. community project that they are. All of us, when we have these experiences and they come from, well, you know, from my perspective, her or any kind of, you know, source beyond ourselves, this is really a gift. And um, very often, most often, the nature of it is communicated to you in a very personal language, in, a per in symbols that, that um, relate to you personally. And it's meant for you, your personal, um, uh, spiritual, psychic, um, uh, just your development. And 
you know, if you go out there willy nilly wanting to tell the world about all these experiences, eh, it can stop happening. And right. Uh, right. and yes. it's showing disrespect to the gift. That's and right. I don't want to show disrespect to the gift, but also I wouldn't want the stream to stop. So right. it's more important to me to experience the stream than to become popular and famous on some stage at a conference blabbing about all of it. Man, there's so much I could say about that. Um, wow. <laughs> I'm so glad that you said that. Thank you. We do got, we're at the top of the hour here, but yeah, that was pretty revealing to me. And I know some of you probably know exactly what he's talking about based on our discussions before. Uh, we'll be right back with Walter Bosley. Interesting stuff. Stay with us. I love magic and enlightening the void each and every week. You will get to hear shows about magic, mysticism, and many other subjects that stretch your mind and imagination. So when I got my mind on the magic and the magic on my mind, I listened to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. It's magic. May the gods look with favor upon you. You're wondering what we're going to do to you, guys. This is Al. I listen to Lighting the Void because it's interactive radio with good content, interesting guests, and a humble host. Share your journey through the esoteric. Hey, Joe Roop. Thanks for having us along for the ride. Thank you so much. What a delightful evening. Well, I got a lot of ground to cover. Somewhere between abnormal and paranormal, there's a show called Into the Paranormal. I'm Jeremy Scott. Hear me live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern on the Fringe FM. Introducing Shadow Light Tarot from Waking Canvas. The Fringe FM's new contributing artist, Eric Tisi. This hand-illustrated black-and-white self-published deck serves as a reinvention of the tarot never before witnessed. Each of the several suits of this 88-card deck lineup form an infinite panoramic scene. Even the included visual companion guidebook is entirely hand illustrated cover to cover with beautiful visuals and esoteric symbols and artwork the newly released deck comes in a custom magnetic box with its own travel pouch the shadow light tarot premium deck and its travel size mini deck wonder light tarot are both available now from wakingcanvas.com if you use the code word fringe that's f-r-i-n-g-e at checkout you'll receive an extra 10 percent off your entire order to discover more including a free reading and time lapses of all the illustrated artwork make your way over to wakingcanvas.com today that's wakingcanvas.com we all have that story to tell in our lives the winds were howling the ground shook you could hear rushing water and then history repeats itself when there's no power refrigeration fails doors with their shelves strip bare atms can't operate delivery stop then what? These events can last days or weeks. You need a plan. In statements made during recent interviews, FEMA Administrator Brock Long has repeatedly urged all Americans to understand three truths. FEMA is broke. The system is broken. If this is the new normal, Americans can't rely on federal cavalry when disaster strikes. Don't get caught out in the elements empty-handed. Prepare with us by going to preparewiththefriends.com and get your two-week food supply, 92 servings, eight food varieties with 25-year shelf life, normally 137 now only $75. Or get a month's supply, normally $247, now only $147 shipped in one business day. Just go to preparewiththefringe.com or call 888-440-7931. That's 888-440-7931. Get this great offer and be prepared while it lasts. 
Who were the real ancient Egyptians? What is it about ancient Egypt that captivates us all? The critically acclaimed series Magical Egypt is back with all new episodes. Let Chance Gardner and company take you on another adventure through Magical Egypt in the new series Magical Egypt 2. Magical Egypt 2 attempts a forensic reconstruction of the science of the ancients through a study of ancient aesthetics. Also, the best researchers and authors in the field like John Anthony West, Graham Hancock, Laird Scranton, Robert Duvall, Lon Mal Duquette, Aaron Cheek, and more join together to explore the topics of the esoteric and the hidden messages of the ancient Egyptians. Just go to MagicalEgypt.com right now and put in the code word FRINGE and get 10% off any download or order, including the groundbreaking original Magical Egypt series, as well as the new episodes in Magical Egypt 2. Also, check out the great work and the companion series at MagicalEgypt.com. Click the banner on the Fringe FM or go to MagicalEgypt.com and use the code word FRINGE and get 10% off your order today while it lasts. We've heard your feedback loud and clear. You called it out, and now we're answering. All new live programming, five nights a week. Always remember, the Fringe FM is for you, the listener. And we appreciate your feedback. Keep the feedback coming. You can email us at talkback at thefringe.fm. Call the station at 501-777-5631. Or send us a message on Facebook at The Fringe FM. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Occult Arcana is a balanced and objective guide to those subjects considered a part of the nature of light and darkness. Addressed in this text is a compilation of material that will provide new perspectives and awaken latent abilities that we all possess. The content herein shall provide magical sustenance for adept and novice alike and will help strengthen the cornerstone of mystic understanding and alchemical transmutation. If you are interested in this modern grimoire, you can find detailed information and ways to order by visiting www.thesecretteachings.info. Although esoteric and occult studies remain vast, they are rooted within a universal philosophy that is difficult, if not impossible by finite terms, to explain in words. Language places restriction and erects barriers to understandings. By this it is to be understood that there are some things man should consider far too sacred to profane with definition. For these concepts and the manner by which we live our lives, we shall take a note from the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, quote, silence is better than unmeaning words, end quote. To get your autographed copy of Occult Arcana today, simply visit www.thesecretteachings.info or email the Secret Teachings at rdgable at yahoo.com. is a call-in number. If you got any questions, you know you can always call in. Of course, I will ask the questions uh, from both chat rooms as well as email. You can email the show at contact at lightingthevoid.com. Tonight, we're here with Walter Bosley. Uh, and don't forget, after the program is The Secret Teachings with Ryan Gable. And um, five nights a week, Monday through Friday, here we start this thing out of around drive time and go all the way into the early morning hours. And I just want to give a quick shout out to those listeners on talk stream live and bill and all you guys, we love you over there. Um, so we're talking about Walter's new book, uh, Napoleon and the esoteric or the esoteric Napoleon is the actual title of it. And, um, you know what I'm, what I find so interesting about this one fact, and I brought this up before the break is 
our fascination with Egyptian culture cannot be dismissed, right? Like our fascination with the, the, I would say like the knowledge, maybe the architecture. I really honestly, Walter, cannot explain why everything that I have found leads back to Egypt. And then I find it even more interesting when people like you who are very interested in the truth that are true journalists also uh, kind of reveal this info that they're taking trips out there, that they're doing things, that there's some type of attraction to Egyptian culture. What are your thoughts on that? It can't be avoided. That's why you see that. That's why it happens. It can't be avoided, um, this mystery of Egypt. And, of, of course, yeah, I'm an advocate of, I'm convinced that the true mystery of Egypt lies in that whatever civilization it was that built the Great Pyramid, um, would, you know, that built the Sphinx. Um, you know, that civilization was a mystery even in the days of the pharaohs. And something, something they did, uh, um, something they knew is reflected in the things that, you know, are left behind. And anybody who looks into these particular arcane subjects um, eventually is going to find themselves in Egypt, um, you know, so to speak. And it, it, um, it, it's something that obviously reflects um, the, 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 the deepest past of human civilization because no matter what culture you come from, Egypt is fascinating. There's, there's something that will lead you back to Egypt. And uh, it's, you know, it's just there. And, and that's the thing about it. It's just there. And um, all these figures like Napoleon and any of the others, um, you know, these are the kind of folks that, uh, that they, they want to know what that, they want to know what the answer to the mystery is or was. And Napoleon was certainly, uh, it was a driving force in his life to understand these things. And he had the means and was in the position to really make his explorations happen. Do you believe that the stories are true that about him coming out of there all pale? And did you investigate yes. that? Yeah, I, uh, that was part of the reason that motivated me to go ahead and do the book was I wanted to find, was there anything to this legend that I had been just vaguely familiar with? And yes, what I found, um, even in the books that are, you know, somewhat critical of him, the facts are there. Napoleon Bonaparte, during the period of over a year that he spent in Egypt, visited the, uh, you know, Giza many, many times and uh, went into the pyramids, the Great Pyramid in particular, several times. Um, and the idea that he spent a night um, is backed up by all the facts and circumstances of his time there. And um, so, yes, I, I think that he definitely spent the night in there. And based on, you know, um, the other things I talk about in the book, the, the fact that his personal mentor was a guy named Gaspar Mange. Gaspar Mange was the father of descriptive geometry. And he very specifically was the uh, originator of something we call the Mange Point. Now get this, the Mange Point named after the mentor of Napoleon Bonaparte, who was his closest companion throughout his uh, Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. Okay. Um, this Monge point is that point in a tetrahedral uh, or, or, or per, pyramid, pyramidon. I'm not pronouncing these words right. A, a pyramidal shape. Uh -huh. um, it's that, it's that point in any tetrahedral pyramid shape. Um, where multiple planes intersect. Now, that's mathematically, geometrically speaking. Now, when you consider where, where this idea of the Mange point came from, Gaspar Mange, okay, who was a, a you know, brilliant mathematician, you know, brilliant mathematical mind, 
He was also a philosopher scientist. He was into these arcane things himself. He was into all the the strange ancient history and all these mysterious things. So when you look at a guy like Gaspar Mange and he puts forth the idea theoretically through geometry that in a pyramidal uh, shape, there is a point somewhere inside that pyramid where multiple planes intersect. What do you think he really means by that? What he means by that is I say, I'm convinced that within an actual physical pyramid, is there a point at which multiple dimensions of reality intersect? And I think, I'm convinced that that's what Gaspar Mange believed about the Great Pyramid. Very specifically, the King's Chamber is where he believed the Mange point of the Great Pyramid was. And being the greatest influence on young Napoleon, I think it, Gaspar Mange was behind Napoleon spending that night in the king's chamber, and it resulted in some type of psychotronic experience. Can you imagine if what you're saying really happened? Everything, yeah, <laughs> you know, everything we know or we think we know is especially like regular academia is wrong. I, I, the more I look into it and the more, and I don't look into it because I'm super smart. I, I try to find guys <laughs> like you to follow that, that look into this stuff. And then you're investigating uh, even greater men in history. And that just all leads back to there's something about, about this that we can't explain. Now I know many men have tried to, I know like you, you take like Aleister Crowley, for example, who created another, another religion called the Lima you know, he really believed in Egyptian gods and power, but there's no telling what he tapped into. And anytime, anytime people get idolized like that, it worries me a little bit. But sure. did, did he tap into something for real, right? Uh, you know, he talks about the alien beings that he drew it out and all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, he decoded a lot of things about the Bible and the, the gematria. If you look into it, it's just some very interesting stuff. But most people, mm -hmm. what I find, won't even touch it because everything that they've been told about Aleister Crowley is that he's an evil man. And I totally agree with some of the crazy things he did. He did it on purpose for a lot of just, I think he did it to taunt the public. But anyways, I don't want to get off on, on Crowley too much. But past him, if you look into to historical figures, there was always something about Egypt and the pyramids and I, I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. the 33rd parallel. You know, that has been considered b by like super conspiracy and woo woo to some people. Mm -hmm. And yet when you look at the facts that it can't, it's not a coincidence anymore. There's something to it. And would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and one last word on Crowley, Crowley factors in the empire of the whale research really? and cool. um, cer certain, yeah, certainly Alistair Crowley passed through San Bernardino during the time of all the weirdness here. He passed through um, on the, via the railroad, and I was never able to ascertain exactly how long he spent here. It wasn't very long, but I was able to prove with the help of the railroad historian that he indeed had to pass through here. But I found that um, a similar thing, and this is why I went back to Crowley, a similar issue um, with that is with Napoleon is applied to Crowley. Uh, now, Aleister Crowley was a guy who loved having a reputation of being this dark, bad figure. But a lot of that was um, his own hyperbole. And there are things that are accredited to Crowley that he didn't actually do and, and all sorts of evil and things that he, he just would have found appalling. Uh, particularly, you know, any crimes against children or infants, um, yeah. you know, it just, he, he would have just no way. Um, and uh, I still get folks who, uh, you know, they don't want to hear that. Just like the people that want to think that Napoleon was an antichrist, you know, yeah, but right. um, yeah, to, to, you know, to, to bring it back to what you're saying on the 33rd um, latitude issue. Yes. I think there's something, there's something to it. There's something to it. Now, if it's to the extent that a lot of people who've been hypothesizing, including myself, um, if it's to, you know, whether it's to that actual extent or not, I, I just don't know the answer to. Um, what I try to do is, you know, 
look into something, present what I find and what I think about that, you know, labeling, you know, my speculations as such. Um, but I would say that with a lot of things, the truth is probably somewhere between um, a lot of the uh, uh, lore and popular mythology that's been built around it. The, you know, the truth is somewhere between that and, um, you know, uh, scientific well, materialistic the near, fact. near point is. Yeah. Yeah. So what, you've got, yeah. you've got mainstream scientific materialistic ideas and facts, and then you've got super woo woo spiritual mythology folklore and the truth. Yeah. Be, it's in yeah. there somewhere, yeah. but it's not one exactly. of the other. So therefore I, I, I think there is something to it. And, uh, from my perspective, which I talk about in the Disneyland book is it's a geophysical thing. That's where I, that was the realm I tried to, uh, to mainly stay in with that. Well, that would make sense too, because I I've actually looked into things like, uh, and I bring the subject up a lot and a lot of people don't even know what I'm talking about, but I've got a couple of listeners that do like biogeometry and uh, things of that nature. It could be uh, some type of energy that we don't understand, or it could be, I mean, look, and when you look at how the earth was structured and I'm sure we've all looked at these things, how perfectly the alignments are, uh, the sizes mm-hmm. and everything that happens to make life happen. Uh, and I'm right. not talking about is creation real or any of that. It just does bring up, like there, there's something mysterious about it all. It can't be denied, uh, in my mind. No, it, uh, it, it, it's there. There's, there's this something that is there and, um, you know, human beings throughout history have just tried to put their finger on it, have tried to, to nail the description. And it's just the classic, you know, blind men in a room with an elephant, you know, all describing what they think is a completely different uh, thing, but it's all the same animal. And I I think that's why uh, this thing kind of uh, evades us because no, there is not one of us who sees the whole thing or can put our, you know, finger on the whole thing. So we're trying to figure it out with all these different experiences and, and different descriptions. But there is, there is something there. I'm not going to deny that, even though I don't like to, you know, we talked about not talking about some experiences. You know, I, I will gladly talk about the result of those experiences. And that is, I've been personally convinced of the things that, you know, I say are real and true. And um, I also understand the nature of this is that, you know, um, not everybody is going to be convinced and certainly not in the way I've been convinced. I think convincing is a personal thing. And when this mysterious thing we're talking about reaches out to convince you, to introduce itself to you, it's going to speak in a language that you understand. So this is another reason why I don't like to share my, you know, my experiences that often, sure. because I could tell, I could tell you my story, but, but guess what? Um, you're not going to, that was my story. That was my experience. Your experience with this stuff is going to be tailored for you and the person sitting next to us, their experience with it is going to be tailored for them. So it's almost a waste of time in many respects to even hear our stories for that third person because they're not going to experience it the way we did. And, um, yeah, I see what you're saying. In, in, yeah. I really do. I mean, I can, I could debate you about that, but I'm, but again, if I did start that debate, then it would be, uh, and I'm getting down a rabbit hole here, but it would be from my own experience of beliefs, right? Because I think that people's experience, um, like what I mean by this is, look, we've been told one thing. If you take religion, for example, anytime uh, your personal experience negates what you've been taught in religion, right? Uh, there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of, uh, things in our lives that tell us, you know, take that personal experience and push it away and don't even think about it. And let's get back to the way order was right. Like your parents right. and all this stuff. They don't want you looking into that. Yeah. Yet your personal experience is yeah. trying to reveal to you a truth. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so I have, I'm glad that people like you, like people that take this approach, this journalistic approach to it, uh, are, are there because you're helping us find the answers. And, um, I, I don't care if you don't want to talk about your personal experiences that that's totally fine. As long as you keep doing what you're doing, 
whatever that, you know, whatever we got to do to keep you looking into it, then we'll do it, man. You know, well, what I hope to do with the way I do my books and such and the way I approach this is to lead the reader into um, their own search, their own quest for their answers, you know, um, by presenting, hey, I looked at this thing or this person and look at this. Here's what I found. Isn't this interesting? And right. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it. it uh, I. Uh, Oh, I was I was going to mention something and I lost it there. It happens. It <laughs> happens. happens occasionally, but um, it, yeah, it's 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 um, it it can, it can be a it can be a touchy thing because I have now remembered what it was. I have two associates who are very close um, in if if there's two people who know all the details of the experiences and all the weird things associated with the, when I've been doing the book research and all the strange things, it's these two guys. Now they are quintessential scholars, academics, and, and, and minds, good minds on this stuff. And, you know, I'm kind of in there with them on the, the scholarly part, but I'm also a field guy. And uh, I'm more of a field guy than they are. <laughs> I'm more comfortable in, in the field. Um, so they each at different times have told me, oh, you're getting close to this is too weird. This is too, you know, uh, powerful. This is too arcane and dark. You know, be careful with that or don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I take, you know, I consider their advice because in certain ways and things, they're far more learned than I am. But I also temper it with my own experience and stuff and uh, understanding that I'm, I'm a field guy and they're not so much. And you know yourself and, too. That's the and thing. I know myself. Yeah. I, I know what scares me. There are things that I shy away from because I just find them, oh, well, no. But it's going back to what you were saying. It's fear that drives, you know, when people say, oh, don't do that or just stick with the order of things. That's really fear causing that. Yep. And, and look, fear is not always a bad thing. Remember, fear keeps us alive. It's a survival instinct. Um, when you experience real fear, many times there's something there maybe in the dark or that you're not seeing that means you harm or could cause you harm. So it's good to acknowledge um, when, you, when you're feeling that, when you're experiencing that. But sometimes it's the um, it's it's that intellectual fear. People get themselves built up in a little hysteria about certain things, and and they have their own comfort zone. And when you are going outside of their comfort zone, and they're your friend or their colleague, and they care about you, they have this natural human you know uh, desire to warn you. Oh, they don't want to see anything bad happen to you. But you know, ultimately, your path of you know of enlightenment or gaining knowledge or you know, learning secrets is your own path that you have to take. And so, you know, you kind of have to politely, you know, you say, thank you for the advice. I'll keep it in mind. I'll watch my back, but I'm going forward. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've done that and it pays off. Yeah. But definitely like, I, I'm so glad that you bring this stuff up. Like earlier when you mentioned that, you know, I was out in the field and I was at the certain terrain and I saw the certain thing. I know my listeners are like, oh, God, please tell me. What did you see? Right. What are the details? Um, please. But well, you... I, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this one because uh, I've said it elsewhere in, uh, in, in interviews. It's not like something I've never said publicly before, but it's not something I talk about all the time. So you, it usually has to be drawn out of me in the natural course of a conversation like right now. <laughs> um, the thing that I saw in 2010, I found something that appears to be a, uh, uh, oh gosh, what's that? A mandala. Okay. Um, that somebody has painted on the ground and it's been there for years. And I went on one and I had found it um, earlier than this particular day. And I went out on a particular day, summer of 2010 in the afternoon between two and three ish. And I was standing in the middle of it. There's a particular spot in the middle of it. I'm standing in the middle of it. I'm facing north, and there on the side of the mountain, I see an image kind of burned into the grass. Now, it, we've all seen those images where they, they'll take like, like, you know, they'll burn an image into the grass for like a school mascot or a city's name if they don't do it in rocks. You know what I mean. Sometimes yeah. it's, uh, they'll do it with oil or something. Um, I saw the image of um what i interpreted it was heck it was a it was a hecate a reflection of hecate in the image of athena 
I saw the image of Athena burned into the, the grass on the side of the mountain. Um, and there was the owl sitting on one shoulder, staring right at me. Her eyes were staring right at me on the, the, the side of a uh, kind of a high hill in the foothills there, the San Bernardino Mountains. And I'm standing there looking at this, and, and, and I'm thinking, okay, is, did, did they build a school in recent years, and their mascot is, you know, the Spartans or something like that, where Athena is their mascot? You know, I thought, that's weird. I've never seen this before. Was this just done, you know, earlier today or in the last couple of days? And I'm looking at this thing, and it's clearly Athena looking at me. Well, uh, I, you know, after sitting there looking at that and going about my business, I left, I went home, got online. There is nothing over there. There's no school or anything that has Athena as a mascot. And I went back and I never saw the image or anything that could have been construed to be the image with shadow or anything. I went back in the, under the same conditions and I went back under multiple other conditions, never saw anything to this day that could have been uh, by light or trick of the eye look like the image of Athena. So what is my conclusion? I'm standing in this middle, the middle of this mandala thing. And I see this vision of Athena, you know, Hecate slash Athena. Hecate has an association to Athena, or I should say vice versa. Um, and, and it happened. And that was, it was a very startling experience. Yes. And that was really um, when I began to not care who believed me anymore about any of my experiences that I had had my entire life leading up to that time or since. And no. it, just, it, it just suddenly liberated me from caring about whether people believed me or not. Heck with them. <laughs> right. And I really appreciate you saying that. That's a, that is a fascinating event. Yeah. Now, I've had something similar, but not like that. That is... Very, very interesting. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we could all speculate about what it was, but I think, like you said, you know, I really think sometimes uh, things happen that are just meant for us to see. And uh, we, if it's up to us, if we want to go down that road and keep investigating or not, look, we're here with Walter Bosley, you guys. We're already halfway through the program, by the way. These nights seem to go by faster and faster. Uh, we'll be right back. Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast, and you're listening to The French <laughs> FM. Hello, this is Vance Nesbitt. Take the time to expand your mind by listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop right here on The Fringe FM. From Studio 401, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on The Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt, and here's our headlines. Pentagon has developed a laser that can identify subjects from hundreds of meters away based on their heart rate. The Pentagon can identify targets from afar using a laser to measure heartbeats. Technology is being developed for U.S. Special Forces operations for surveillance. Infrared lasers are able to penetrate clothing and skin to monitor blood flow. Heartbeats are completely unique, unlike faces or even thumbprints. And currently, prototypes have a range of about 200 meters or 219 yards. Source, Daily Mail. And a man survives after a bear breaks his spine and keeps him in the den for food. 
the emaciated man from Russia's remote republic, was preserved to be eaten later by a brown bear, according to local reports in the region. A group of local hunters found Alexander after their dogs refused to leave the area of the den. Their persistent barking pushed the hunters to check inside the lair where they found the barely alive man. He was rushed to a local hospital and has been diagnosed with a broken spine and severe emaciation. Alexander does know his first name but cannot remember his age. He was reportedly in the den for around one month drinking urine to survive. He is now in intensive care with multiple injuries and rotting skin. He is able to move one arm, according to the hospital doctor's report. Source, the Siberian Times. And a woman claims an encounter with a dwarf Bigfoot creature in a Tennessee cave. Out of Hamblin County, Tennessee, a woman in eastern Tennessee says she came face-to-face with an unknown creature she describes as a miniature version of a Bigfoot. Leslie said that she and her husband were in a cave that is located inside their property when they spotted the creature. We rediscovered the cave six years ago, and it has many unexplored chambers still. This is what she told Thomas Markham of the Crypto Crew. Reportedly, as her husband pointed out the strange animal, Leslie decided to go down and take a closer look. What she found attached to the cave wall, she said, prompted her to run out of the cave, screaming and crying. The alleged being was described as a four-foot-long and four-legged creature with a hairless human face with brown eyes, although the rest of the body was covered in brown hair. Source, CryptozoologyNews.com And marking the end of this newscast with an amazing fun fact. Wearing headphones for just one hour will increase the bacteria in your ear by 700%. Thanks for listening to the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on The Fringe FM. Again, I'm Vance Nesbitt, news anchor and sorcerer. Sounds of Bundy. Look, if you guys go to the website, you can definitely tell at lightingthevoid.com that I've, I've been playing around with it. And uh, you guys can definitely tell I'm no design, web designer. Uh, and it's, look, to be honest with you, at the website, some of you guys are asking me questions about where this was, where did that go. Um, look, I'm just playing with stuff until it gets to where it needs to be. Uh, but if you go to lightingthevoid.com, You'll probably find new stuff there in the next few days. And then we're also going to be updating the friends.fm. And don't forget, we've got a ton of great shows on the network, right? Uh, our newest host, J.D. Lewis, who does Real Talk. Uh, I'm sure all of you know by now that's Clyde Lewis's wife, and she's knows a lot. She's in the know, and it's a, it's a, good, it's a good show. Uh, but tonight on Lighting the Void, we're here with Walter Bosley. And before the break, uh, we were discussing Napoleon and Egypt and what – what everybody's fascination is towards that. And then we got into personal experiences versus, you know, fact and journalism. I, I do wonder though, because I can't help Walter about your background. I wonder how has your background in the military and counterintelligence, does it affect you on your viewpoints on this, on these things? Um, first and foremost, and do you find that, uh, do you find that it's difficult, right? Like, does it help you more or is it more difficult because you have that background when you do these investigations? I don't know if I'm making any sense. Oh, it, it, 
No, you're making sense. It uh, it definitely helps. Remember, before I went into the national security career, I was kind of uh, into these weird things, and I was an experiencer of stuff already for years before I started my career. So I was this weird guy when I went into that line of work. And, of course, that line of work really just enhanced um, the, the, meth- the methodology of how I investigate these things. Now, the one thing that my time in the Air Force – um, that has directly affected my view on that is the subject of UFOs. Um, I have, I came away and I stand by this. Um, I think that uh, 90% of all reported UFO sightings, the legitimate ones, not the ones that are, uh, you know, people just wanting attention or clearly fake. Um, 90% of those can be explained by classified human technology. Now, whether it's military or whether it's, uh, you know, private aerospace efforts, I firmly believe that 90% of UFO cases can be explained by this. Now that leaves 10% in my opinion, that, uh, I think is where the, the, the more fun stuff fits in the, you know, the otherworldly stuff, extraterrestrials, uh, the possibility of interdimensional things, the possibility of other strange phenomena that uh, manifest as what we call UFOs. Okay. Now people say, Oh my gosh, Walter, only 10%. Well, I want you to think about something. You know, um, I think, uh, for instance, MUFON in the month of April, I think reported, uh, 5,000 some UFO right. uh, reports. Okay. Yeah. Well, 10% of those reports, let's say all 5,000 of those are legitimate, 10% is 500 in a given month. That's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of, five, for, for 500 people or 500 sightings of some otherworldly UFO to be reported in a given month, that's still a lot. Okay, that, uh, you know, and imagine if it were that way every month, you're into the, you know, the thousands of reports that still are, you know, they're within that 10%, but they're otherworldly. And, you know, it only takes one. It only takes one ET sighting we can prove as such. It only takes one interdimensional UFO to be proven as such to make it true, to make it real, you know, officially to be able to say, yes, this is real. So when people um, get uncomfortable, when I say, hey, I think only 10%, that still encompasses uh, a, a much bigger number than they're interpreting it to be. But yeah, definitely my time in the Air Force convinced me that, yeah, about 90% of what people are seeing is, you know, kind of really cool, amazing advanced technology. Because remember, witnesses tend to exaggerate the experience a little bit unless they kind of learn how to be a trained observer and they're honest with themselves, you know, the excitement. And I'm not saying if they enhance it or exaggerate it, that they're doing it for nefarious purposes because the excitement leads people to, you know, Oh my gosh, it did this, it did that. And it was this and that. Um, so, uh, right. Yeah. I think, I think that excitement, that adrenaline, when people see some weird advanced technology leads them to just assume that, Oh, this is otherworldly. This is ET or something. Well, that's so. exactly why I, exactly why I partnered up with Tim and UFO seekers is because he takes the same approach that you do with this stuff. And, He's out in the field mm-hmm. with investigating and using every, I mean, he's got technology that he uses to investigate. He doesn't even talk about, right? Cause he's trying to get an edge on all of this stuff. And he reports mm-hmm. on his website and he reports back to us that look, man, most of this stuff is military period. I mean, it's military, mm-hmm. but he does have some pictures and photos and uh, videos of some things that just cannot be explained. And one of them I know for sure, if it's military, then they are definitely into some stuff that we don't know about. Uh, I'm talking about things that mm-hmm. phase in and out, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But but yeah, and I I'm or, glad or that you least, said that, or at least or at least appear to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're like these. Uh, it's hard to explain. A couple of other investigators have caught them, and they catch them with still photography. But they're like these orange, amberish, even brown looking ball like things that tend to move very quick Mm -hmm. and they phase in and out and nobody knows what the hell they are uh versus uh like what you're saying when i talk to some people it's everything is ufo it's flying saucers and motherships and spaceships and everything everywhere 
Uh, and then when yeah. you bring up what you said, and here's the most important thing, I think, when you say, well, 90% of UFOs are probably military, people get upset because uh, in their mind, mm-hmm. for some reason, they think that you're negating UFOs and alien life. Right. Yeah, and you're right. not at all. Or they say, well, how would you know? You know, have you seen one? Well, yes. I saw one in December of 2014. I've talked about this publicly, um, but I didn't start talking about it until um, two years ago. I didn't feel comfortable talking about it, and I got pictures of it. I got video of it. Um, you know, it's it, so. You know, I have seen one, and it was kind of a really wild experience for myself and, and the witness. But um, I, it it it's just. It, it it happened. It was there. What it was exactly, I I couldn't knows, tell right? you. Yeah. But um, so I, I understand the experience people have, um, you know. But that's what good. My view is okay. What good would it do me to just tell that same story over and over again? Right, yeah. Because there's just a limited set of facts. And no, it was nothing like anything that would lead me to believe, you know, like you said, you know, Oh, this was a scout ship from a mothership. This was, no, this was just a single object. Um, I have no way of, it it didn't appear that, you know, there would have been anybody in it. Um, but you know, for all I know, but, uh, you know, there, there it is. I had that experience. I feel like that I'm, and I'm I'm about to give up on it, honestly, Walter, but I feel like that I, I'm the guy that it's out there trying to convince, uh, the alternative people that believe in everything that, you know, the ones that say, well, I'm just open-minded and whatever's your truth is my truth and this and that. And I, I, look, <laughs> yeah. truth is truth. Truth to me is things yes. that are unchangeable, right? Things that are there. Yeah. That's truth. Your truth versus my yeah. truth. Th- those are viewpoints and perceptions and experiences. Exactly. Um, but exactly. I feel like that I'm trying to, bring people like you and others into that community. And I'm trying to get that crowd. And I think some people do know this about me by now to listen to you, to people like you, to people that are really getting into the details and digging and trying to find the truth. I can't stress how important that is. And you know, you may not get to the answers doing that, but I don't want that to go away. Walter, I don't want, I don't think it will, but I just want it to keep happening. Right. And I see the frustration with people like uh, Tim and other investigators and researchers mm-hmm. where they just give up, man. They're like, you know what the hell with it? These people aren't going to listen to me. So I'll just do my own uh, thing, you know? Yeah. It's, it's particularly in these days of, um, uh, the, the, the kind of media titillation people now have been conditioned for. They just want to constantly be titillated. They want to constantly be, um, adrenalized and, um, you know, very often the truth, you know, doesn't give you that shot of adrenaline. It's just, it is what it is. And people, people right now are in a weird state. That's a whole other, you know, discussion. What I experienced after, honestly, I have increasingly uh, uh, been less and less, almost to the point of non-interested in UFOs after having my sighting. It's weird. It, it's because I mean I grew up interested in that stuff and and uh, after since having my sighting now it's been it's four and a half years I I honestly I I just don't care about the subject it's not that gripping to me as it was before I mean I still have very much an academic knowledge of it and I still have an opinion on it and I will look at cases and and stuff but it's just not not it it just doesn't I, I have kind of a eh about that to me there's other things but look at this over here let's look at that over there that wow that's interesting and i just think it's i i find it interesting that you know the correlation there is having seen one it's i don't know i don't know, you know if it's the there. experience that's did it. that yeah. yeah i know no, it's there. there that's what it is i know it's there i know these people are seeing things i mean the the people that are really you know, giving the legitimate reports. We all know there's people who fudge and lie to get attention. Um, but the people who are, you know, reporting these things that, you know, the legit, of course, uh, of course they're seeing these things. It's real. And, um, uh, you know, but it, it, and it is what it is, but the question is, what is it? And (laughs) that's for, and again, it comes back to 
wow, this is interesting. Once again, the seeking on the individual path seems to be what is encouraging. Right. Okay. Yeah. I get the feeling that the UFO phenomena, whatever the answer is, whatever the source of the of the mystical ones, the strange ones, you know, um, the the legit unidentified ones. I think. Um, I, I mean, I've said that you know, ET, the ETs are going to, which I I'm convinced they're out there. Of course, to me, it's just logical. When they decide to show up and disclose themselves, they're just going to do it themselves. They're not going to care about you know this. They're just going to say, hey, we're here and we're from there. But th- these. There's another kind of UFO that that people are attributing to alter dimensionals that it's definitely that's part of its nature, but it has this this source that's directly tied in and connected with our with our uh, our psyche, with our our spiritual, our enlightenment, and who we are on that mystical level. Okay, and that's also a source of things we're calling UFOs. Exactly. And when it manifests itself as the UFO thing. Um, it, 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 in the cases I've heard, it's always been to an end of, you know, one or maybe two people, you know, a small group and, and they don't, I, the impression I came away with is, you know, don't go, don't go make hay over this. This is for your personal individual path, you know, follow this path, follow the lead as an individual, you know, privately That's why I find, and see. Uh, certain cases. And I get what you're saying with that, Walter, like uh, that's why mm-hmm. I find certain cases like Calvin Parker's case interesting. You know, th- th- this mm-hmm. happened to this guy, and he said, look, this thing had appeared out of nowhere, and he didn't talk about it, right? He didn't talk about it for years and years and years until he got old enough. He said, well, I think it's time to talk about it to the public and my family. And I've been around these southern guys my whole life. I know who's pulling my chain and who's not. You know, I work sure. in car sales. Yeah. I know who's doing it and who's not. This guy had a real <laughs> experience, you know. Something happened, and when I look into uh, what you're talking about, like I think there's a direct tie to that too, especially especially in the case of of things like Aleister Crowley when he started drawing those pictures. All the stuff that he did, uh, the the rituals and all the intensive meditative work he did, I don't think people really, mm-hmm. n- unless you've really studied Crowley, understand what he did. To get to that right. point, and then when he got to that point, he's drawing what appears to be aliens. You know that that can't be pushed aside, uh, and he's no, not the no, only one. Can't be. No. Yeah. So yeah, it, it it's it, it, it there seems to be there seems to be a someone or a something out there that uh, may be using what we think of as aliens as kind of a mask. Um, you know, and you could, again, that's a whole other conversation as to what it could be and who it could be. And people are having that conversation uh, in some corners, in some places. Um, but it's, there is something that is this, you know, it's, it's the great mystery, but it's right there for us. It's accessible to us. Um, if you look for it, but there seems to be it. And I'm speaking from my own research and my own personal experience here. I can't speak for anyone else. Okay. What I found is for some reason it demands individual attention. It it wants to introduce itself to you as an individual. It wants to um, uh, reveal itself uh, piece by piece, step by step, to you as the individual, for some reason, there's an importance in convincing it's going to disclose itself to all of us one person at a time. Yeah. Yeah. It's not concerned about the belief of the mass population. Is that what you're thinking? Right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like this. I'm not a people person. I don't really care for groups of people. I don't like, I say this, I don't like people very much at all, but I really like persons. Individuals are always much more interesting to me than groups of people because why, you know, human beings, when we get in groups, we run the risk of acting like jerks or, or subjugating our own intellect for the group think. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, so groups of people, identities of people as a people don't interest me, but the individual persons, fascinate me and 
And a, a lot of that has developed because of these experiences and of the research into this stuff is because whatever that intelligence is that is communicating to us with symbology, with this unspoken uh, language of the mind and synchronicity is just, you know, the, the synchronicities are the threads in this fabric that it's trying to reveal. Um, it, it comes to us uh, individually. Yeah. It introduces itself to us individually and we can either, you know, ignore it and deny it or we can embrace it and kind of follow that thread. And, you know, it can be a wild ride, but it's out there. There's something that's there that's just just hiding out of our, our peripheral vision. We see glimpses of it. Um, but uh, once you once you start looking at things like synchronicities and such, once you look at the fabric closely, you cannot unsee it. Yeah, you can't deny it anymore. That's why I say, like, uh, we say the truth is out there, and so are we. Because the truth is out there, but society kind of looks at us like <laughs> we're out there, too. But, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I am. Mm-hmm. I, I, I do see what you're saying, because I've been, you know, sitting in a campfire talking to a person one-on-one is is different than going to, say, like, a, I don't know, an evangelistic-type conference where people get real cultish and weird. It's almost like there's some mm-hmm. kind of program that runs when we all get together, you know, that makes us act yeah. ignorant sometimes. I, and I hate to use that phrase, yeah. but we do get that way. Well, yeah, that I- ignorance is part of it. And, you know, I'm somebody who always, you can ask my, uh, my, my second ex-wife because she's the one that really noticed it is that, um, when I'm in a gathering, be it like a family gathering or a party or something, I'm the guy that can kind of by choice, I can kind of disappear into the wall. And, um, and, and, and it's by choice <laughs> it, yeah. because in a crowd, I'm not going to compete for the spotlight. I'm not going to compete for a t- attention in a group, you know, um, let the, uh, let the, uh, the, the, the folks who are Leo's and they're the sun instead of the moon, you know, <laughs> right. let, let them bask in that, uh, that attention that, that they like. I, I'm a Libra and, um, you know, a peculiar individual at that. So, um, but you're the fly yeah, on the but, wall but that might write a book about it with, later with more details than anybody could have noticed. Right. Yeah, well, possibly, I guess, because, you know, the, because of observation, right? Because you stop and observe. But when I'm with somebody one on one, um, I, I can really engage. And, and, you know, if I'm not careful, they could possibly not get a word in edgewise, which your listeners are probably saying, yeah, we believe that after tonight. <laughs> no, man. <laughs> no, uh, usually it's it's me doing that. And uh, but I want to get back into your work here. But I want to ask you one sure. more question about UFOs. Mm hmm. Uh, Mm-hmm. I've heard you comment on this, but I didn't quite get to listen to the rest of it on another show. It, with the history of UFOs, there is a, some type of weird history. Like if you go back into uh, like, like the 40s and 50s, you see it's all about flying saucers. And then as it moved mm-hmm. on, then it was triangles. And then now yeah. in the 2000s, we're talking about interdimensional things more than we're considering that. Uh what have you found like in history? Cause, and I'm talking about deep history all the way back to Napoleon, things like that. Do you think that there were UFOs back then? Have you found, I haven't found a whole lot about it. And everybody keeps saying Ezekiel, this and that, but that could be metaphors. I mean, has anybody reported on this stuff past that point? Oh, sure. And, um, I, I, my personal, opinion based on you know what i've read of other people's work that's been around for years and then my own that i've contributed to the to the field is that there have been uh groups that have dabbled in uh you know very old information um old technology that for the most part has been lost to you know, uh, most of us in the world and uh, through history and they've gotten their hands on it and they've been dabbling in it. And that would explain, um, uh, you know, some of the historical sightings. Now in my work, um, uh, origin, I talk about the 19th century development of, um, looking into the proof of concept, at least of, of, uh, you know, what for all, intents and purposes looks like anti-gravity technology. It looks like it and it could be that. And actually it's, it's the thread leading from the mid 19th century 
through the airship mist of the 1890s and into the German um, uh, experimentations with the legendary bell. And I have found evidence that a group in the 1850s was actually working with a proof of concept rudimentary version of what we call the Nazi bell. And it's it's a, astonishing and astounding, but there it is in a drawing that was done sometime between 1893 and 1923 when the artist died. Okay, that's years before the Nazis were fooling with the bell. Okay, but there it is. And it was claimed to have been being done, being used, this bell in the 1850s. And by the way, by Germans. So there you have, you know, a thread um, tying, you know, a, a prior historical period to something modern that we're aware of that too many people today or a lot of people today want to say, oh, the Nazis got the idea for the bell from from a, a crashed E.T. flying saucer that they reverse engineered, which is nonsense. There is absolutely no legitimate evidence, none OK, that there was uh, that the Nazis got their hands on a crash saucer. People will point to Hanabu. People will point to this stuff, but they don't look close enough at the history of that stuff. It's all it's all nonsense. It's not true. But actually, when you look at this thread of um, uh, of, of messing around with this proof of concept bell, um, you see that, hey, human beings have been fooling around with these weird things for a while. And um, that's going to explain some of this stuff people are seeing. Fascinating. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm looking into the history of UFOs at this point myself. So I'm pretty curious about those types of things. Uh, look, if you're listening to the show right now and you want to go somewhere for reference, there's a couple of places that you can go. You can go to empireofthewheel.blogspot.com. Uh, and uh, you, that'll, there's all kinds of links there that lead to his other websites and all of his books uh, that he's published as well. And tonight our main focus is on the esoteric Napoleon, a little bit more about the 33rd parallel. We're here with Walter Bosley. Be right back. Dan Lopez from Spiritual Warrior Today Radio, and you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. AncientLifeOil.com. For your CBD needs, just remember, AncientLifeOil.com. Was it due for the body, you ask? I can't say due to the people in the suits that run the industry. Big Farm is all over CBD because of its H-E, well, you know what I mean. Research the benefits of CBD on Google and come back to ancientlifeoil.com and purchase your CBD today. Non-GMO and all organic. You don't want to be using a petroleum product. You want to be using the cleanest CBD product on the market. Ancientlifeoil.com We even have CBD for your pet. Help your pet's discomfort. Help your discomfort. Log on to ancientlifeoil.com That's ancientlifeoil.com Newly reduced prices to pass off the savings to the most important person. You, ancientlifeoil.com. And one more thing, we have topicals too. So if you have joint pain and some different issues that are going on in your body, you might want to use a topical. Think about it, ancientlifeoil.com. Yahoy there, Gigi here from Shift Happens. Do you like to boogie down to topics such as ufology, the occult, and the mysteries behind our reality? Why well, invite you to join us every Friday night at 7 p.m. Pacific, that's 10 p.m. Eastern, as we like to punch that curiosity button and tickle that fancy. We tickle that fancy, but yeah, you know, I don't know if that's the right analogy, but there's certainly a lot of tickling going on over here at Ship Happens. In your face, all over the place. We're online 24-7, 24-7. You're listening to the hottest internet station. 
Do you want to know the truth? Are UFOs real? Are aliens visiting Earth? Are governments around the world hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO Seekers, official partner of The Fringe FM, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Join us as we investigate locations like Area 51 by subscribing on YouTube at youtube.com slash UFO Seekers. Greetings, galactic community. This is Suzanne Ross, host of Sci Spy Radio, every Wednesday evening from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific. Join me for this brand new show featuring a revolutionary new genre, Sci Spy, merging science and spirituality to give us answers to the greatest mysteries of creation. Together, scientific discovery and spiritual revelation reveal the truth about who we are, where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. Tune in to Sci Spy Radio every Wednesday from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific and discover the truth for yourself at thefringe.com. Hey, it's Jeremy Scott now here me on KTLK The Fringe FM. Live Saturdays at 7 Pacific, 10 Eastern. You got it. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. back to lighting the void uh listen if you got a question you can always call in that phone line is always going to be there i was just joking the other night about taking it down uh you practically broke them on friday night but if you've got a question uh, for walter or you want to comment on this it's 1-800-588-0335 i do see some of your text ins and uh, i'll get to that as well that text in number two is 501 777 31 which is pretty much the uh the station number don't forget tomorrow night we will be doing a rebroadcast i'll be spending time with the family on the fourth uh, throughout the night and then friday we'll be back with the open lines i'm pretty sure jd lewis is going to be the co-host for that night and uh then we'll keep this thing going also mary rodwell is going to be coming on the program uh too so we'll look forward to that we got Grimerica america coming up lots of great guests and uh, i want to thank all of you for your support and tonight we're with Walter Bosley. Yeah, this has actually been a conversation that I kind of knew that was going to be the way it is. Um, and I and I don't want to sound too, I, I don't know, too cliche or or sound like I'm blowing smoke when I say things like this, Walter. But people like you, uh, people like um, Dark, the Dark Journalist, anybody that that really looks into the truth of things, even if they have different opinions. Uh, you could take Randall Carlson and Robert Schock, for example. They have different opinions on the cataclysms. And I am so mm-hmm. stoked about it. And I want to try to protect that. And that's why I bring that up a lot. Right. That's why I say I want to try to protect it because I've, I've seen too many people give up on these things. And I don't think you're going to do that, though, because I've looked at just how many books you've got out now. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Now I've got something else I can, I can really binge on. Yeah. 
I'll keep doing this as long as I'm living. I mean, this, uh, the, these things, this, no, this is, uh, I'll be writing about something arcane or strange, you know, as, as long as my fingers work and I can write. And when that doesn't work, I'll go to audio books. <laughs> but um, I, I do want to say this, that because, um, you know, you mentioned dark journalists and myself and some of the others. When people hear um, when we're critical of certain things and individuals, some people will say, oh, well, you must be um, uh, a skeptic, you know, or a debunker. And that's not that that couldn't be further from the truth. I know for a fact that, you know, Daniel and myself, and of course, speaking for myself and others, we actually we embrace the strange. We, we believe these things, you know, that there's extraterrestrials, that there's psychic powers, that there's strange phenomena. And the reason we're critical is because we recognize a fake and a charlatan when we see one and we don't like what happens to our field and our community when these guys are just running rampant and, um, you know, uh, just be, being allowed to, to, to spread the untruths and, and really make the legitimate researchers, the legitimate field look bad. So it, it, we're, we're not skeptics. We're not debunkers. The only thing we debunk um, are, are the fakes and the nonsense and the BS. That's what we um, oppose. You know, uh, we have no trouble with you know, the reality of UFOs and the likes and, you know, any of this weird stuff. Yeah. And I don't and I I'm happy, you know, it's I'm happy you're doing this. It's kind of like I, I saw a video that Ron Patton put on Facebook, who is mm-hmm. a friend of mine about, you know, Cliff High getting banned from a city. And and I'm, th- that stuff bothers me because yeah. it's like, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. You know, we need. Uh, people like Cliff High, whether you agree with him or not, he needs to go out and, and investigate this stuff. We need, like, I just want to protect this thing. It's not about a war or a battle with me or or trying to right. negate somebody's belief. It's just right. all I care about is the answers and man and trying to find more truth about it. That's it. And I right. think a lot of people feel that way. And we don't need it cluttered with the BS. Now, my understanding, just briefly on the, the thing with Cliff, was he wasn't even he he wasn't going there to speak at the event. He wasn't even going there to attend the event that was going on. He was going there to use the Isedi um, uh, lodging facilities and just do his own private thing because friends and associates of his happened to be at the event. So he wasn't even going to be public about himself. And it sounds like that the uh, you know, so, some of the uh, characters and individuals that are, in, you know, involved with what's going on there are just, you know, they're they're playing their game, um, using their influence and, and spinning up a bunch of nonsense. And this is part of the stuff that hurts the field and the community. And these are people who don't like, you know, the, the, the classic con man, you know, doesn't like the, the person who sees through the con and is tipping everybody else off to it. You know, that makes a con man angry. And, um, you know, this, this is kind of what has been going on, so to speak, but you're right. Going back to, you know, we're just trying to, uh, protect the legitimacy of looking into these things, of talking about these things. And when you get these, um, you know, these storytellers and, uh, uh fakers and, and liars in the mix, it just, it kind of, it hurts everything. Did you, I'm curious, did you take. I've always wanted to take a course on this, but are, there are fundamental uh, tests about learning if people are lying to you, right? Did you get to? Did they teach you that mm-hmm. stuff in your uh, when you were working for the military? Yeah, when I was, I was a uh, you know a special agent with OSI my entire time on active duty. After you know, after OTS, and I went to the a- to the agent academy, and I spent all my active duty time as an agent. So yes, you get. You get the training for interviews and interrogations and things like that, and you're you're taught, you know, the tools um, to read a person's body language, to read their speak, you know, to listen to what they're saying and, and read between the lines on that, and to recognize the ticks and the. Uh, you learn some things that they jokingly tell you after they reveal this stuff to you, and, and a lot of it is they reveal things to you. 
and it'll you know it blows your mind how it works and they they jokingly say now don't use this on your loved ones <laughs> don't <laughs> right. use this on your spouse or your children <laughs> and you know i here's the thing without even trying um and i irritate the heck out of certain family members when this happens but without even thinking i'm applying this stuff i can tell when one of them's lying to me and i'll call them on it and it yeah puts them in the corner and um, they, they don't like it because they were lying to me. And it's just kind of, it comes, it starts to come naturally. You, you can just tell. And it's, they're the ones that, that are revealing themselves. It's all them. It's all the liar who's, who's basically waving that flag saying, you know, I'm not telling the truth because I worked with not only um, interviewing subjects of criminal investigations, but then I got into counter espionage operations. I was chief of uh, counter espionage operations branch at Wright Patterson for three years. This is, this is double agentry. Okay. This is uh, That's some deep stuff. Handling, there. Yeah. Handling double. A. So when you're dealing with um, you know, someone who's working for you as a double agent, it, it, I mean, it notches everything up. You're concerned, okay, have they been turned back on us against us? Um, you know, what, what, you know, is it, could there be any problems? So you gotta, you, you gotta have these skills and, um, anybody who's handled assets and sources, um, in, in any operational situation knows exactly what I'm talking about. And you have to, um, you kind of have to let that develop and, um, you know, just always stay aware of these things with people. And, um, have you yeah, been watching so strange that, angel? Cause it reminds me of that, that, you know, that show strange angel where Crowley was, uh, you yeah, look at the Crowley's I, I, background as an intelligence. Uh, oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I need to binge watch that show. I haven't, I haven't watched it yet and I'm anxious to do that. But yeah, the whole Jack Parsons, uh, um, yeah, part of Empire of the Wheel. I have a co-author on Empire of the Wheel 1, the first of the three volumes, uh, Rick Spence, Richard Spence. Now he's the I've author. I've talked to him before. Oh, yeah, Richard. fascinating guy. Had him yeah. on the show. Yeah, Secret Agent, Secret Agent 666 was his book that I was reading. I had read and was looking into the threads he pulled on Crowley, and I contacted him. And um, he was giving me such great information um, from his perspective and his research angle, but finally I said, Hey, why don't you co-write this book with me? Because you know, it's it really, your stuff really resonates with this. And so he agreed to, and we wrote the first book together. And, um, I learned a lot more about Alistair Crowley and his intelligence activities and such. And, um, it really, uh, helped me with the intelligence activity aspect of Empire of the Wheel, because that's all in the mix. It's not all a cult mystery. There's, there's, uh, you know, some serious espionage issues that were going on around all of this. Yeah, there's a, the reason why I brought that up is because there's an agent in that show who's constantly grilling Parsons and them trying to get information and figure mm -hmm. out if they're reporting it to Crowley because they're paranoid about Crowley, you know, and it made uh -huh. me think about that. Like when, you know, they're, they don't know who's a double agent, who don't. So they're grilling them big time. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's an interesting world. Yeah. So I, loved it. I think what I've, that, that's a big question of mine. I had a list of questions here. I wanted to ask you, and that was one, cause you take somebody like mm -hmm. you that's been involved with that. And then you come into this field again, I'll bring up the fact mm -hmm. that, uh, others want to know like, man, what did he see? Like, what does he know? And just the fact that you said, look, you know, you confirmed that a lot of the stuff is need to know, but you did observe some strange things is enough for me. It's totally enough for me to know that there's something to a lot of this stuff. Um, but your empire of the wheel series, uh, is that what you did right before you released this book, those three books? Uh, you, you mean right before the Napoleon book? Yes. No, no. Nap Napoleon is, is technically it's secret missions for okay. the esoteric Napoleon. And what's interesting is <laughs> it's, it's a, getting a little bit like the uh, Rambo movies, you know, first blood or, or, or Rambo one, first blood part two, you know, um, it, because <laughs> the esoteric Napoleon volume one is the one that's released and there's going to end up being two volumes. I'm working on the second volume now. So it, but it's actually the fourth uh, in the series of the secret missions books. Um, I look at historical figures who I suspect 
were literally on a secret mission or a personal quest. And it always involves uh, arcane knowledge and ancient history. And the first book, Secret Missions 1, of course, was about Juan Cabrillo and the sword of Joan of Arc, among other things. The second one was the lost expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton, which um, it just still fascinates me to no end. He, he disappeared in the uh, Brazilian jungle for a period of four and a half months and never a word has ever emerged uh, stating what really he was up to. And that's what my book is about. And um, the third book, Secret Missions 3, um, was uh, it's uh, Ambrose Bierce and the Empire of the Wheel. It has a little bit of overlap to Empire of the Wheel issues. But it's about Ambrose Spears and, and uh, the certain things I think about his life and uh, including what really happened, what I think really happened to him after he disappeared in Mexico. And, and so those were the first three books. Now, um, when I finished Empire of the Wheel 3, The Nameless Ones, uh, I immediately, 10 days later, started writing Secret Missions 1 because I had been collecting the data on the Juan Cabrillo thing for years. So, um, no, the Secret Mission series, uh, as a series, followed Empire of the Wheel, but there were three books between uh, Empire of the Wheel 3 and this Napoleon book. Plus, plus in that time, I wrote Shimmering Light and Origin, the Breakaway Civilization book. You know, the more I think about it, I really think that you are, like, the the perfect, and I hope you don't take this wrong, but the perfect person, like if we had a modern day molder, that would be you, I think. I think you could do <laughs> that job. I really do. You know, like uh, because you've oh. got the background, you know, you got you've done the stuff you've uh, you've got the mindset for it, and you're open to stuff like just like molder. It reminds me so much of that, man. It really does. Yeah. I don't know why I was thinking that. Oh, Sorry. Well. Well, but no, no, thank you. You know, Mulder is one of the coolest uh, characters out there. And uh, um, what's interesting is the other night when I was talking with someone, um, they said that um, I reminded them of kind of of Scully, you know, with because of the way I, I approach stuff. So what I think is there's a whole bunch of Mulders and Scullys out there among us. And each one of us, you know, part of us is Mulder and part of us is Scully, right? You know, um, yeah, but you've, kid, you've been in the field. You've done the work, though. I mean, do you know anybody uh, else that's in this field doing that? But so, I mean, I'm sure there's uh, maybe a couple. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, you know, Nick Redfern. You know, he goes oh, yeah. out and looks at the things, um, you know. Uh, but I see what you mean. You're, you're right. There's not a whole lot with my specific background. Right. Uh, you know, who who do this. Um, so, uh, you know, I like to take, if I do have a unique perspective, I'm coming from a unique position. I like to, um, have the work benefit from that. Um, you know, one thing I don't do, I never embellish my resume. I can't stand resume embellishers. Um, and, and the honest thing is, I know people say, well, people do it all the time. Well, guess what? In certain fields, you know, some people might do it, but they're not respected for it. Believe me, they're they're not respected for, it. and particularly in the field I come from, you you do not embellish your resume because that that's that's kind of against you know a, a code of honor. I like to be clear on what I was, and I like to be very clear on what I was not, um, as far as the background goes, um, because what I did actually do and what I was again um, enhances you know the work, the research. So, yeah, you know, if, if I bring some kind of, um, you know, perspective from, you know, a unique position compared to others in the field, um, I, you know, all I can hope is that it benefits what I do. And I'm glad people, you know, are, are appreciating that. I'm glad it's coming through. Yeah, you know. it does. I do appreciate it. And it's not, uh, you know, I'm not, trying to be like, wow, you know, I'm talking to a guy that worked in counterintelligence. Everybody look at me in this show. I'm just trying to say, you know, look, uh, we've got real people that, that have got real uh, investigative skills mm-hmm. that are in this field, and we need to pay a lot more attention to it. And I think I'm so happy that you're looking at these subjects. Like, take Empire of the Wheel, for example. I was reading your blog, mm-hmm. and I noticed on there that you said 
Well, there's some actual, there's some people uh, looking at you for TV shows, and that's all you said about it, right? Well, yeah, mm-hmm. that would be really awesome. And I've noticed lately, uh, specifically on streaming things like Netflix and Amazon and uh, even the History Channel, that you know, back in the day, it used to be Ancient Aliens, which uh, you know you were a part of, and uh, but now they're making all kinds of shows about the occult, Crowley. And, mm-hmm. and they're really digging into the details a little bit more. Do you think, uh, do you think society is looking at this more? Are we still considered the weird folks or, or do you think people are more accepting to these things now? It's both. It's still considered weird, but, um, uh, there's more people. I do think there are more people in numbers, um, open to it. Uh, it's still though, it's, Still, for the most part, we have to be honest with ourselves. It's still kind of fringe. This is this is the amusement I get out of. You know, right now things are all exciting in the UFO world because of certain elements and certain players are really you know talk about padding the resume and blowing the hyperbole. Um, you know, uh, and there's people acting like the world cares about this. <laughs> in all honesty. Go to your grocery store, your hardware store, you know, or local gas station, you know, and ask people, ask them if they've heard of, you know, um, this organization or that person that, you know, uh, you know, TTSA or, or Louis Elizondo or, or, or you know, um, whoever. Um, and, it, you know, it, I'd, be, I'd be surprised if you found one um, because, yeah. quite frankly, yeah, it's still – it's still something that's in the margin, okay? If not on the fringy edge, it's still in the margin, but here's the difference. Um, I, I don't think it's as written off as easily by as many people, and it's not as ridiculed by as many people um, as maybe it, it once was. It's certainly not um, – I, I think one of the big litmus tests was, it, it, you know – is it something that parents would discourage their children from thinking about or looking at? And I think in our times, um, there are more parents that encourage looking at, you know, it as opposed to discouraging it. And I think that says everything about the generations, you know, the parents and the grandparents now, gosh, I mean, I'm getting to that grandparent zone, even though I'm not one yet, you know, we've grown up with, from the time I was a little kid, there was the invaders that I would watch with my dad and, you know, all the TV and movies, Close Encounters. So, you know, the parents and the grandparents grew up with this stuff being encouraged. So there's your difference is um, the attitude towards it. But uh, it's still, I think it's still in the margin. And between you and me, I I, I think that actually has maintained, um, do I want to say integrity? Or it certainly maintains the, uh, for me, the enticing aspect because, um, you know, I kind of like things that are off in the corner or to the side or the margin. Um, you well, know, they brought the Twilight the Zone back, for heaven's sakes. They're, I mean, yeah, they brought a lot of things back. I, th- I just wonder, I don't know the advertising numbers, and I would be curious to look at somebody who knows these demographics and these numbers mm-hmm. if we are making a bigger influence on society than we used to. Right, it just seems that way to me. Or maybe I'm just focused on all the new TV shows. It could be a, a perception thing. Because well, well, I, you know, they've brought that back. They've done what? Um, uh, isn't this like the kind of the third remake of Twilight Zone, or the or or the fourth? Um, I, you know, they even did the same thing with it. The, so these things go in cycles. Okay. Um, all right. You know, you you do have the the revisiting things in cycles, but you know what's that reflects the interest. So the, the interest is there. What you're saying is legitimate. There is um, interest in it. I think the, it's the tone of the interest, the attitude, the approach of the interest is different. And like I said, uh, I think it's less on the outer fringe and more, you know, c- coming close closer to the center would be in the margin, right? If you you have the center, the mainstream, then you've got the margins to either side, and then you've got the fringe, that outer edge. And where this stuff used to be on the fringe, I do think it's moved in to where it's at least in the margin. I, yeah, I, I, you know, I yeah, think you're right. The, when I think about what you just said, I do remember speaking to Class Vaughn, who runs one of the largest UFO and uh, paranormal archives in the world. 
and has been around for quite some time. And he said, yeah, this happens. He said the same thing. He said, these interests, they come in cycles. Uh, but people like me and people that are interested in real data and, you know, he's kind of like you when it comes to looking at the data, uh, that he's, he, he sees that there's some fanaticism about it and the interest falls off, but it's those people that really stay in the grind with the data that they get somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. But I, uh, it, um... I am curious though about one last question and I'll leave your resume alone. Okay. But I've never <laughs> got to ask you this question. I'm sure somebody else has when the, to the stars Academy came out and then look, this is a subject that has been beaten into the ground. Right. But, uh, huh. I'm yeah. taking this opportunity. When Tom DeLong came out with his intelligence group sitting behind him on TV, now we're talking about a rock star, man, that, that gets on stage in front of massive crowds. Didn't something seem off to you about that? Do you remember his presentation, right, when he got up and he was introducing to the yeah. stars and he had those people behind him? He, his, the veins were popping yeah. out of his head. He looks like somebody had has put him into a vice and forced him to say certain things. He just didn't look right. Did that seem weird? Well, and then, well, and then you follow that up with his notorious appearance on Joe Rogan, which, you know, people have pointed out that he hasn't been out. He hasn't done, apparently hasn't done another, you know, live interview like that since, um, because, you know, there's something squirrely about the guy in relation to his venture. What I think is that DeLong himself is a sincere guy, sincerely interested in this, and I think his vision for this TTSA thing was, uh, you know, a legit vision and, and something that he sincerely wanted it to be, what, how he describes it. But what I think, what I suspect is that um, the uh, call it national security apparatus, call it military industrial complex, whatever, a little mix of both. Um, saw where it could be useful to them. Um, and I think they've kind of taken the, I think they took the reins from him on, uh, on it. And uh, I think he probably to address specifically what you're pointing to, it's possible that he, he realizes, you know, what has gone on, uh, you know, now, maybe not initially. And, you know, it kind of feels between a rock and a hard place where the public uh, perception is concerned. I could be totally wrong, um, but. Uh, yeah, that's is, all I wanted was is, just your, your opinion on it. You know, like yeah. what you see uh, based on, you know, your experience with these types of things. Because it's like uh, there's a lot of weird things going on. And, and mm-hmm. I bring it back up because there are weird things going on. If you, if you look into the documents, uh from the black vault and stuff. And then the government's denying uh, Elizondo was ever even a part of this stuff. And mm-hmm. it's like, what the hell? Mm-hmm. Right. When the TV show comes yep. out, you know, what's going on here? Yep. There's a lot of weird mm-hmm. things going on. Yeah. Well, and some of it that appears weird is just good old fashioned, um, uh, prestidigitation, you know, slide a hand and, and trying to put one over on an audience possibly to, uh, yeah, to make a buck, but maybe more likely to control a narrative. Um, I've been exactly, vocal yeah. in my distrust of the whole TTSA thing, and you know I stand by that. Um, you know, but it, the 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 ultimate truth on it remains to be seen. Right, Just like when he said see. they pulled me into a room uh, and asked me these questions. He brought that up very vaguely. You know. And, you know, when he's like, when somebody pulls me into a room and starts asking me these questions in a concrete room and, and everybody's like, oh, he's lying, he's lying. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Maybe he's not lying. Maybe they did pull him into a room and ask him some questions. And you don't know. You know, they could be using him for a campaign, a narrative campaign now. Exactly. Yeah, right? that, that could. And that's, I suspect, something uh, like that is going on. But, you know, like I said, I'm not an insider on that, and I don't want to be. Um, that's an interesting thing, too. They have dangled to various people in the community, um, you know, hey, uh, kind of, you know, work with us, get involved with us, see what it's like from the inside, you know. And uh, that's been kind of an interesting thing going on. But uh, it's still, you know, it's still kind of interesting to watch, Um 
It is. You know, we're we're seeing we're seeing how it plays out. I think it's very damning what the Pentagon came out with regarding you know Elizondo. It looks like at the very least we come back to this uh, resume padding, um, and, and it's easy it's easy for guys to do that in that world. I've been in that world. Okay, not maybe not his specific position, but I've been in that world, and um, it, it's hard. Up till now, it's been pretty hard, almost impossible for civilians, outsiders, to really get any confirmation on, you know, claims that, you know, guys, you know, that like myself were formerly in could be making. But um, so, you know, you, you could get away with resume padding, but it's interesting how, you know, just somebody like John Grinewald just simply ask the question of the right person and wow, look what happens. This is another reason why we do not pad resumes, that we do not spin a position into anything. You just say what it was. Now, you know, sure, he was an agent with the uh, Office of the Undersecretary of the Defense, the OUSD, and uh, someone, uh, I don't know if it was Cliff High or someone recently said, hey, if he was on, oh, no, it was Kevin Randall, said, hey, his position, he might have been, you know, just on the CC list of, you know, uh, reports and, and um, correspondence from this uh, ATIP program, uh, it doesn't mean that he was deeply involved if he was, you know, just on the CC list for this. And, uh, you know, to expand beyond that, uh, it's dishonest. Right. So somewhere, somewhere, somebody or something is being dishonest in that whole thing. And it just, again, we're back to it remains to be seen how it falls out. But somebody either has their information wrong from the inside there or somebody's not telling the truth. And it's just going to be, um, at the very least, embarrassing for particular parties involved. I think it already has been from what you know other people have commented on. Well, what I like to do here is, uh, because we're at the last break of the night and we went over a little bit, but I had to ask that question. Is the last segment sure. I like to ask, the deepest questions uh, that are on my mind, and that's exactly mm-hmm. what we're going to do. And, yes, I do see your text. And your text questions are weird, but I still ask. Uh, and uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> A little bit more. There's some weird ones here, man. And maybe they know something. I don't. But uh, we'll be right back oh. with Walter Bosley. Listeners, this is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Alex X. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. We've heard your feedback loud and clear. You called it out, and now we're answering. All new live programming, five nights a week. Always remember, The Fringe FM is for you, the listener, and we appreciate your feedback. Keep the feedback coming. You can email us at talkback at thefringe.fm, call the station at 501-777-5631, or send us a message on Facebook at The Fringe FM. All right, everyone, this is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussels, but he ain't no holy friar. Anyway, you be the Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. I'm Ryan Gable, and I want to remind you to keep your radio, phone, tablet, or computer tuned to The Fringe FM. And visit the website, thefringe.fm, to listen to the entire lineup of shows. You can also catch my broadcast, The Secret Teachings, Monday through Friday, beginning at 12 a.m. midnight U.S. Pacific Time, right here on The Fringe FM. So, have you heard of heavy metals? I'm not talking about the heavy metals in the junkyard. I'm talking about the heavy metals that build up in your body. 
Heavy metals in your body can make you feel sluggish, fatigued, and just plain off. Why not try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com? Cleansing your body and making you feel great. No, not cleansing the outside of your body, but cleansing the inside of your body of intruders that sneak their way into you and set up an intruder camp. Life Change Tea helps remove unwanted intruder camps. Brew it. Steep it and drink in the results. Tastes great so you can create a new health habit. Our tea loves to help people. It just needs the chance. So order yours today by logging on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Our life change super strength tea is waiting. This could be a beautiful relationship. Take charge of your health. Order at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Howdy, this is Catalina, and you're listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop. This is Corbin, son of the one and only Joe Roop, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Did you know that qualified patients can access medical cannabis in all 50 states? Anasense is a medical cannabis collective that helps patients in all 50 states gain access to cannabis medication. Anasense does this with a streamlined process and strict compliance with the Compassionate Use Act of 1996, the Affordable Care Act, and the U.S. Constitution. It is important for each patient to understand the legalities involved, the costs, and the benefits of cannabis medication. Through truth, legalization, and education, the medical benefits of cannabis will supplant recreational perceptions and the real vision for change will be realized. Let the people and their personal doctors take control of their medical cannabis decisions before the greed of big business takes over. The tipping point for change is today and CannaSense is ready to lead the charge and enable legal access for all qualified patients to medical cannabis through its proven system. For more information, go to thefringe.fm forward slash care or click the banner on the website today. That's Chronos. You go to the website chronosofficial.com. Uh, we've got some projects working with that, so we got uh, some actual bumpers and even better music coming from this guy, who I believe you're going to hear in the movies uh, as far as soundtracks and stuff goes. Everybody always asks me about the music, so that's why I'm telling you that. Tonight, we're here with uh, Walter Bosley, uh, author, investigator, and uh, just all around really cool and very interesting guy, I will say. Uh, but there's no question to uh, how good your writing is. There's too many people that brag on it. And so we've talked about a lot of things tonight. Uh, and uh, we've gotten into a lot of subjects, and I'm very happy. But So I, I want to dive deep here with you, Walter. Uh, your new book wow. is um, The Esoteric Napoleon. We already talked about uh, you know, the occult, the esoteric, ancient symbolism, things like that. You brought up your... Uh, series that looks into these people what was it called again can you tell me what that was called again the series the not- secret secret missions is secret the series missions. that you know, so so far i've looked at four historical uh in figures napoleon being the fourth in that and uh i i'm just i'm starting volume two on napoleon so you know um and who know who knows who will turn up next how it usually works is when i'm working on one book the threads uh, threads pop up and some of those threads will lead to the next book. Uh, that's, that's how I work. I, I've never sat down and said, 
I need to write a book and I need to write a book about this subject and then began to research it and come up with it. No, no, no. My books have always been the result of research that I've been doing. So, Yeah. And um, so, and some of these people, these figures, they tend to look into the occult and esoteric a lot. You know, we discussed that about uh, Hitler, Napoleon. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there are many others. Here's my question to you. Do you find... I want to talk about symbolism because you brought that up earlier and I, I kind of saved it, brushed it. We brushed over it, but I have found that symbolism, mm-hmm. there is something that interfaces with this realm and the next. I've discussed this with Laird Scranton and many others. We just think symbols are symbols, right? But I really believe, and mm-hmm. this is just my belief that symbolism is a language that taps into all of these subjects. And if we learn more about it, about symbolism, we might actually start revealing some secrets. And you brought that up about the personal journey. And there's just some things we don't talk Mm -hmm. about that are public, but I'm wondering if you found that same thing when it comes to deep symbols, and I'm talking about arcane Mm -hmm. stuff here. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And uh, the way you described it was, you know, perfectly uh, spot on. I think, uh, you know, Carl Jung was getting into this with the archetypes and the archetypes are one of the ways in which this um, symbolic language uh, is delivered, is spoken, so to speak. Um, Certainly, uh, you know, makes it easier to interpret through the ages, through the various cultures. Um, But yeah, it definitely is a language of its own. And um, what's really interesting about it is from the first time it's spoken to you, you get this intuitive understanding because it is, you know, symbols. It it is something that speaks to um, your psyche. Um, You know, you might speak English and the next person might speak Spanish and the other person might speak, you know, Mandarin Chinese. But um, when you're being, you can be told the same things the same exact thing through this symbolic language um, that speaks to your psyche and each one of you of a different verbal language understand that same message because it was delivered, you know, to the human psyche. Um, So, yeah, I think you're right on with that. It it is a language of its own. We, um, we talked to Michael Wan on the program who I looked into his work and I'm still kind of looking into it. Uh, and it goes along with uh, the 40th parallel. Like he noticed that on the maps, the old maps, that the mm-hmm. four and the zero were backwards. And, and he started, he's like, well, what's that? And he got to look and he found all of this Masonic symbolism and structures that go back to these uh, Masonic and alchemical, and I guess we could say arcane symbols. When, uh, when I look into that, and I look into the fact that in Masonic texts, they talk about, you know, the United States was supposed to be the new Atlantis. It's been called the new Egypt or the new Jerusalem. And you look at the building structures like the Pentagon. Well, if you really look at the Pentagon uh, and look into the Masonic ideology of the Kabbalah, which uh, Albert Pike pretty much said, look, these Blue Lodge guys are 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 going their rituals are have to do with the Kabbalah. They just don't know it yet, but they'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. But anyways, when I look at that and I've noticed that the symbol for Gabor, and I don't want to get too deep here, but it's the, the Sephiroth on the tree of life that relates to Mars and wars is they erected us that symbol, that building of war. And Mm -hmm. to me, it's like, okay, you invoked that power. Uh, and that's why, you know, we're leading the way when it comes to the military and stuff like that. Now, people are going to say that's crazy, mm-hmm. but there are several monuments like that that have that yeah. speak to higher powers, if you know what I'm saying. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I do know what you're saying. What, what we have to do, and this has to do with, for me personally, what I was talking about a while back about when I crossed that Rubicon. What we have to do with the people to say, well, that's crazy. We just have to just ignore them and go about our business because this is what the people who are using these symbols do. You know, they, in fact, they use the disbelief, the, the uh, skepticism 
to their benefit because the, in essence they say, oh, you're right, it couldn't possibly mean anything. It's just a five-sided building. Of course it means nothing. Of course there's no power invoked to this because here's the thing. Um, you know, the UFOs, the ghosts, um, Hecate, for example, this is what I've learned about Hecate. Um, these things exist. She exists whether, you know, your neighbor or the loudmouth guy at work or the bar says she does or not or, or the <laughs> rabid – skeptic guy on the podcast, you know, says she does or not. Hey, she exists and she doesn't really care. You know, UFOs don't really care. Ghosts don't really care um, who believes they exist or not. The, their attitude is I exist. So <laughs> you're a fool, you know, <laughs> go ahead, think what you want. And the people using, doing this, you know, building the, the, the Pentagon or, you know, uh, putting other structures together in certain juxtapositions, they're actually counting on that doubt. They're counting on that general ignorance um, in order, you know, to, um, to go about their business doing what they're, they're doing. For instance, I found um, after already being into it for a few years, something I had overlooked in downtown Riverside. Now, it's, uh, it appears to me to be a um, – uh, uh, what's the word for it um, – Oh gosh, not a sanctuary, not a chapel, a uh, um, a temple or a mosque. Oh, but, uh, not a a. Oh my gosh, the word is a lodge. Me, uh, it, it's it's when you have like you know a, a saint and a little dedicated spot. What, what is that word anyway? It appears that there's something an altar, uh, a shrine. Okay, no, a shrine, a shrine. Okay, it appears to me that there's a shrine to Hecate. Op, uh, an open in the public, once you see it, you can't unsee it, Shrine to Hecate in downtown Riverside, California. It's um, on a particular corner. There are symbols directly associated with Hecate right there. There's even the image of Hecate and her wheel right there. And it can't be missed for those who understand, who are familiar with Hecate. I mean, it, I've taken people familiar with this stuff there, and I said, look at this. And they just, they almost laugh. They're like, oh, my God, this is so blatant. But yet, most people walk by it every day and think it's something else and don't see the connection between what's down on the corner of the sidewalk and what's on the corner of the building, right? Exactly. But those with eyes see, you know, as they say. And um, the people that are doing this have been doing it for a while. I mean, of course, you know, this kind of thing dates back to the Great Pyramid, of course. Um, but, uh, yeah, this kind of thing has been done. And I think that there's this little unspoken, under-the-surface culture um, of engineers and uh, landscape designers and, and architects who are part of a tradition. And they're, they purposely um, uh, design these images. And there's been books written on this. No, 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 no. I'm with you. Keep going on this, please. Yeah, there, there's plenty of books written on this. But, um, you know, it, I, I think that there is this culture, and they are both um, laying things out in a place that's pleasing to the human psyche, like using the golden mean and things like that. But at the same time, they understand the, um, the very uh, uh, proactive aspect of the presence of these things. It's not just pleasing to the eye and the psyche, but it is also, um, what's the word for it? Uh, it, it, it? It actually triggers the psyche. These are actually um, metaphysical images that, um, that work a magic on the observer. Um, this is, you know, what I think was essentially done at Disneyland, which I, you know, which is what my Latitude 33 book is all about. And when you take the, uh, the, the symbols, the symbology of the statuary, the architecture and the landscaping, and then also take those things that mean something and put them on a place of geophysical energy. Oh boy. You know, then you're really, uh, you're talking about somebody wanting, you know, something to, to effect some type of uh, measurable result, um, unbeknownst to, to the general public. Yeah, I'm totally with you. And I've even seen it in little bitty things, uh, 
uh, like at a skate park that my son used to go to where he would tell me that, you know, these kids, they, they say they're going to meet here and fight, but every time they go there, uh, they always end up being mm-hmm. friends, like weird things happen. So I went out there and, uh, I was looking for stuff like that. And I found a yeah. flower bed that had rock crystals on it. I'm like, well, that's strange. Uh-huh. And I started noticing that it shaped something. So I went home got on Google Maps and zoomed in, and it was a huge pentacle, a perfect pentacle. Whoever laid that flower bed oh, put it there wow. to protect those kids. And bad things, wow. or even, they're very rare there. Like, there's some type of settling presence there. It's really strange. Mm-hmm. And I started noticing sure. that, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's cool to that you would even what? comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and once you see specific things or it's pointed out to you, you can't unsee it. That's what's great. And now, now the dangerous side, and this is where earlier when I was talking about a field guy versus the, the, the scholar guy, the office guy, so to speak, um, the desk guy, is that one can, if you, if you, if you get too deep into these weeds, um, it can lead to, to madness of a sort. Yeah. And um, so. Where you start thinking everything is another, something. Yeah. Yes. You, you know, the paranoia is just the first level of the madness, but, um, this goes back to why I think, you know, we're not supposed to just share every weird thing with everybody. That's part of it because, um, part of, uh, part of pulling the thread and following a path is earning, you know, uh, earning and preparing yourself to see these things, to notice these things, to have these experiences, to see something manifest itself because what's manifesting itself wants to know that needs to know that you're, that you're ready for it. Okay. And, um, when people go taking shortcuts, bad things can result in Tibetan magic. They call it the, uh, the short path actually. And the people who follow the, the monks who, and uh, you know, the, the, the acolytes, whatever that, that follow, the short path that's the one that leads into the uh the black magic and the the you know the the right. dark mysticism and stuff that comes with perils serious perils yeah they call it the left hand path and uh western magic i believe uh, right yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly so it you gotta be careful with this stuff um this is why i'm convinced my mentor when he was working on me when i was a young college graduate and and uh, we, we would talk about the weird stuff every bit as much as anything to do with the career. He told me um, with both the career and this weird stuff, he says, you have to keep a sense of humor. Always, always, always inject humor, you know, into it because otherwise, you know, it can be bad. And I, I totally found that, you know, he was right. And, um, you know, I've maintained the sense of humor about this um, all the way through. Because you know, because I'll tell you what, um, it whatever it is, whoever they are that are reaching across, communicating to you, manifesting, okay, they're having a good laugh on you whenever they want one, okay. They are injecting humor into it as much as possible, and um, so you better, you know, have a sense of humor about it. And and I think. W- probably one of the best reasons why you should, or one of the things you come away with it is no matter what we're learning or is being revealed to us on this weird level of reality, our primary purpose for being here is to live this life in this physical form and the, the, the interpersonal interactions we have with the individuals who are important to us and things like that. I, I really came away from all these weird experiences and particularly the intense period during empire of the wheel with that understanding, gotcha. realizing, oh, okay, it really is all about, you know, our interpersonal relationships and and living this you know, this you know existence that we have, right. and um, that's I think that's how you can also keep your sanity is by remembering that. Because I'll go, I'll tell you, I'll go weeks without ever really. You know, I have gone weeks and sometimes months without ever really getting deep into the weird stuff. You know, I'm right. busy with the mundane things. You know, I mean, I'm always reading. There's always a book. But, well, um, you know. Well, I hate to cut this off, Ben. I, I was going to ask the question that was texted in. 
Uh, be honest with uh-huh. you, the person that texted it in was, it's about volcanoes and UFOs, and I don't think it has really anything to do with what we're talking about. We only got like 60 seconds here, so I apologize to that texter. But I'll answer personally after the show, but I, I want everybody to know uh, where they can find your work at, um, so can just please plug okay. away by all means. I only... Uh, release my books print on demand at lulu.com, L U L U.com. Um, you know, there's only a few titles on uh, Amazon Kindle, mo- you know, mostly the, the pulp fiction stuff I write. But um, yeah, lulu.com, it's worth the wait. They put out a good product. Um, you know, you get a, a printed, you know, really nice book. And um, I also have, there's the empirethewheel.blogspot.com uh-huh. site, but there's also the Walter Bosley channel at YouTube. And, you know, you see me talk about my research and talk about other things in the field and you see a different side of me. I, I you know, I have, I have a lot more, I, I have a lot of fun on the, the YouTube channel too. So um, yeah, that's where, uh, that's where you can find me and that's where you can find my books. Well, thank you again so much for coming on the program. And, guys, we'll see you uh, Friday night. Don't forget the show is produced by the Fringe FM. Just don't copy without written permission. Uh, go check out empireofthewheel.blogspot.com, uh, Walter Bosley, and check it out on Lulu. We'll put all the show links in there. we got to roll out of here, guys. And uh, thanks to Pacho and Don, music by Cronoaks and Bundy, Kevin McLeod, and the public domain. We'll see you guys tonight. is advised.